Before we begin, you may notice strange things happening in our faces during the episode. They're due to the fact that I somehow managed to mess up setting the focus of the camera when recording, which resulted in blurry footage that I then tried to save with the help of an AI tool. To my eyes, the outcome looks mostly okay, though occasionally a bit weird. I imagine you'll survive that. Coming up in this episode. Hilariously ironic. Uh, messaging that comes out particularly like even more so in the 1980s than in the 1970s but um you know these drugs are bad people who sell these drugs are bad and they're dressed in sinister cartoonish kind of clothing um and you know you need to be on the lookout for this bad stuff um meanwhile in the same sometimes these are in magazines and the same magazines are promoting smoking and drinking alcohol and so this kind of moral association with, you know, not just bad drugs, but bad people who take them and may suggest you use them too, um, does not apply evenly to these other kinds of psychoactive substances that are flowing even more freely, perhaps, than ever before. Hello, fellow Curious Earthlings. Welcome to the Curious on Earth podcast. I'm your host, Henders Oinoma, and this is my conversation with historian of science, Erica Dick who specializes in the history of psychedelics. One of her areas of study is early research into LSD and other psychedelics in Canada in the 50s, about which she wrote the book Psychedelic Psychiatry, LSD from Clinic to Campus. Erica recently visited Finland, where she gave a lecture in the Psychedelic 2023 conference, which was the second ever interdisciplinary academic conference on psychedelic research in Finland. During her stay, I got the opportunity to sit down with her and uh, dive deeply into her work. Topics that we discuss include early studies pioneered by the open-minded psychiatrist Humphrey Osmond, uh, where the aim was to better understand mental illnesses such as schizophrenia, and where it was more the professionals who took LSD, not the patients. Interactions between Osmond and his colleagues and members of the Native American church, which uses mescaline-containing cacti in their religious ceremonies, moral panics and using drugs as scapegoats for society's ills, anti-psychedelic propaganda and the equally dishonest counter-propaganda by people who love psychedelics a bit too much, the appreciation that the co-founder of Alcoholics Anonymous, Bill Wilson, had for using LSD as an adjunct for the 12 Steps program, captivating stories related to the infamous rum smuggler, uranium entrepreneur, amateur pilot, LSD enthusiast, and government spy Al Hubbard, and the fascinating architect Kiyoshi Izumi, who took acid in order to deepen his understanding of mental illness. These are just some of the themes that we cover, so I hope that you'll take the time to listen to the whole conversation. As always, if you like the content, your subscriptions, comments, likes, shares, are very welcome. Um, if you know other people who might enjoy this content, please tell them about it. And uh, if you want to support the creation of this uh, podcast further, you can also check out my Patreon page at patreon.com slash curious on earth. I hope that you enjoy this episode. Welcome to the Curious on Earth podcast, Erica Dück. You're a, a professor of the history of medicine in the University of Saskatchewan in Canada. And we are here in Turku, Finland, in Obo Academy. Uh, we've, uh, uh, we've been in the Psychedelic 2023 conference that was organized here. And, uh, and yeah, we've been planning to do a podcast for, for a while and uh, we're finally here. So welcome. I'm glad you're doing this. Thanks so much for having me. So your specialty is the history of psychedelics, uh, the history of LSD, especially in Canada. Um, so we might start with you um, explaining a bit about how that emerged as a research topic for you. Yeah. You know, the, I get asked this question a lot, and I think that some people perhaps assume that, you know, I... I took a lot of psychedelics or, you know, I was a child of the 1980s and 90s and I encountered them in, you know, exciting rave spaces or something like that. And unfortunately, the story is a little bit less interesting <laughs> or differently interesting. 
I, you know, I worked in, in politics before I went into graduate school, and I was really interested in uh, social democracy, you know, politics of the socialists, uh, uh, so-called, where I was living. And I started with doing a research project for a historian of science who wanted me to look into the history of human experimentation all over the place. And I found this interesting intersection of LSD studies that took place in Western Canada that were sort of recruited by the architects of Canada's Medicare program. So these, you know, this kind of socialist government that puts Canada on the map for introducing publicly funded health care. And I thought here was this really interesting constellation of, you know, medical research and political experimentation taking place in my home province. And uh, so I was sort of drawn to the politics and I perhaps stayed for the psychedelics, if you will. But it really led me into this world of history of medicine that is framed in these really deep political questions about why these experiments flourished in this space and the kind of meanings that they brought to different kinds of political and, and medical reforms at the time. Hmm. Uh, so for, for people who don't know about your work, uh, how would you like uh, compress uh, your focus, like what you particularly have focused uh, on regarding psychedelic research? Yeah, I started doing psychedelic research, the history of psychedelic research in the late 1990s, early 2000s. And I would say at that time it was characterized by really a deep curiosity of just discovering the the narratives of what had happened in this context. These were stories that, to me, had been quite buried, uh, that I was quite unfamiliar with, even though some of them took place more or less in my backyard. But over time, I think my goals with this history have changed as psychedelics become more part of mainstream conversations, if not mainstream activities and experiences. I think that the role of history is has changed a little bit. And, you know, I'm more interested in it now in really delving into some of the more diverse ways that psychedelics found expression, both in medical spaces, but also in cultural and social spaces, to try to understand what it is that we are trying to revive or what psychedelics mean for the future. And so I guess my my goals have changed a little bit, and uh, and I hope they continue to, to grow in that direction. Hmm. You've mentioned that the topics that you've uh, written about have mostly been neglected in the history of LSD, for example. So what are the topics that have been covered before you started wo your work? Yeah, when I, when I started doing this research, well, I mean, some members of my committee, I think, thought it was kind of cute or, you know, almost funny or comical that I would be studying a bunch of people who were interested in psychedelic drugs, uh, that these were not really serious topics. And the the literature available, the English literature available at the time, seemed to concentrate on conspiratorial aspects of this history. So some of which is, you know, the the sort of big stories that rise to the top of our imagination might be, you know, the CIA funding for psychedelic studies that were investigating areas of mind control and surveillance or stories about the unethical uses of psychedelics in some medical treatments. And outside of those medical treatments, I think the story of psychedelics, the kind of common understanding of psychedelics, tended to gravitate towards these colorful characters, these psychedelic avatars, if you will, of the counterculture, people like Timothy Leary, um, who kind of breaks the ranks of these medical trials and moves into this countercultural space as something more of a psychonaut and a real apostle of a psychedelic moment. And others like Ken Kesey, or maybe we look at the music of the time and this kind of flourishing of psychedelic culture that becomes very much untethered from what we might think of as sober clinical trials. And and I think those those different interpretations of this history really um, challenged us in the in the early days or in the early two thousands that is um, to resurrect a different kind of story about LSD experimentation one that walked a finer line between complete reckless hedonism as was characterized in the countercultural expressions and unethical or conspiratorial aspects of the medical research. Mm. Uh, so you're from Saskatchewan and that's very central to how the story of psychedelic research really emerged and not just in Canada but in the in North America in general so why was Saskatchewan so central 
It's a funny, it's a funny thing. I, I believe that if you were in Canada, very few people would think Saskatchewan is central, except perhaps on the map. It's, you know, a little bit, no pun intended, left of center um, <laughs> in the Canadian map. Um, but in the 1940s, Saskatchewan became better known because it was the first province to elect what was called a socialist government. We can quibble over how socialist they were, but they, they certainly ex expressed themselves uh, on the socialist end of the spectrum. And in doing so, they were elected in 1944. And the premier, who also appointed himself as the health minister at the time, he campaigned on a promise to deeply reform or in introduce a form of publicly funded health care. Um, and so this is the origin story in some respects of Canada's Medicare system now, uh, something that Canadians are very proud of and certainly distinguishes us from the Americans who continue to have a private system. And while it is not perfect, that story continues to be a really important part of sort of Canadian identity and Canadian history. And so Saskatchewan is really known for that, being the origin place of that part of our history. And yet, what I hadn't appreciated was how much LSD experimentation was woven into that story of the sort of intellectual and financial investment in a public health care system at the time, such that LSD experimentation was not only funded by the same architects of Medicare, um, but it was promoted and I think allowed to flourish and move in innovative ways in a well-funded research environment that was really designed to reform psychiatric care, to think deeply about our mental health system, if you will, and imagine different ways of empowering patients or ex-patients and reestablishing relationships with communities. And I think that ethos of public investment and uh, ideas about public health uh, were really at the heart of some of those early days of psychedelic research and allowed them to continue and were sustained for longer because people from a variety of different places began to gravitate to Saskatchewan as this kind of ideological magnet for investing in a set of ideas that really took root there. Mm. How would you describe mental health treatment at, at that time and especially like before the reforms that happened what was the starting situation yeah i mean saskatchewan was very much like many other places and certainly around the western world where the the sort of main entry point for psychiatric care at the time was long custodial stays in these long-term institutions asylums mental hospitals to some extent, psychiatric wards, but, you know, we've all seen or can imagine, you know, horror movies that build on these big gothic style asylums. Um, they are the stuff of horror movies uh, now and I think even then. But these big sort of monolithic buildings dominated both the landscape but also the thinking about psychiatry. This idea that you needed to keep people segregated from their communities, from their families, from kinship ties. And that um, somehow this isolation was itself going to be reparative, which I think that idea fell away quite quickly, um, but the segregation idea held. And I think there were a number of very frustrated psychiatrists, certainly, you know, throughout this period from, you know, beginning in the late 19th century onward. Saskatchewan opened what they describe as one of the last asylums in Canada was, you know, still built in that um, institutional model in 1920, and this became the site of the LSD experiments that took place. And there were a number of superintendents and psychiatrists who were really frustrated with what they saw as the kind of wasteland, these warehousing of people in these facilities, um, and wanted to put some efforts into reforming that. They're not alone. There are psychiatrists all over the place who are looking at investing in different kinds of treatments. And we see the 1920s, 30s, and 40s, the rise of things like lobotomies, electroshock therapies, or um, ECT, electroconvulsive therapy, different bodily therapies that are designed to change the way that psychiatrists handle mental illness and perhaps even bring some, um, bring a veneer of, of professionalism and even a kind of medical um, credibility to the field of psychiatry that would have kind of languished by comparison with some of its other medical subspecialties. And so I think there was a kind of open-mindedness, if you will, to the desire to experiment. And sometimes that moved in radical ways and perhaps took liberties with patients that by today's standards we would see as quite horrific and, and quite unethical. And yet I think they were quite desperate at the same time. Mm. 
And as I understand it, there was also considerable economic hardship in there at that time. Yeah, I mean, the after the First World War, um, the combination of the you know recession that became it moved into a depression and um, climatic conditions, where at least in Saskatchewan, a very agrarian place, a lot of a lot of the topsoil blew away, and the uh, the twinned effect created a real deep hardships in in the province. And some people suggest that that is part of what led to the rise of the the CCF, the Cooperative Commonwealth Federation, or this socialist party that was elected on kind of a, a landslide election. They had campaign for farmers and laborers and and very much were sort of taking this economic recession by the horns, if you will, and um, trying to find ways of bringing more state control to to change those economic conditions. And so I think the the depression had a had a profound effect on the popular interest in investing in state reforms at that time. Mm. Just as a brief t- detour as you're speaking, I realized that I don't really know about Canada, like the extent of Canada's involvement in the world wars. Can you briefly say something about those? Canada was still uh, in the First World War. We were very much tied to the Brits, so we did what they said. Um, I think it wasn't, I'm not, I'm not a military historian, and someone will correct me out there, I'm sure, in a comment, but I believe it wasn't until the Second World War that Canada independently um, declared war. I think they waited all of, you know, some hours that might have been 24 after Britain declared war just to demonstrate our independence. Um, but our involvement very much is is uh, very similar to the British involvement, so deeply involved rather comparatively with the United States, for example, that joins several years later. Um, but we're very much a colony at this time in some mm. respects. <laughs> Yeah, I have to put a mental note to do some research on that at some point. <laughs> it's interesting. Because, um, yeah, I think Canada, in the way like these kinds of histori- historical events are talked about, Canada is often left in the shadow. Also, probably in the shadow of the United States. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, I think that's often, often sort of how Canadian historians have seen this is, you know, we're kind of socially and politically often kind of caught between these different, these other kind of um, empires, mm. <laughs> sometimes forgotten about, which is a good secret. <laughs> mm. and, and politically also seem to be somewhat close to the Scandinavian countries. There's a yeah, lot there's, an interesting, there's an interesting connection there, I think, um, not just with the, the climate, but some of, and there were a lot, there was a, quite a bit of migration. Um, I can think specifically there were a number, there was a sort of migration of, Swedish immigrants who came to Minnesota and then moved up into Saskatchewan and were part of those early reforms and brought with them different political ideas about public health in particular, some of whom sat in important positions designing some of the public health infrastructure. Mm-hmm. And I know that we are not in Sweden, but um, but certainly I mm-hmm. I will go back and look to see if there were Finns, but there were definitely some, some Swedish um, men involved in some of those bureaucratic decision making. Mm-hmm. Okay, then we come to what's happening in Saskatchewan. So, what were the first steps that were uh, taken there f- uh, that enabled the uh, LSD research to start happening? Yeah, so the the premier Tommy Douglas, um, this this man I referred to, who sort of campaigned on this promise to bring us Medicare, right away set about hiring and recruiting people into positions. And one of the people he recruited was Humphrey Osmond. So in 1951, allegedly, Osmond responded to an ad, and uh, Douglas recruited him as first the clinical director, and within a few months, he became the superintendent of this, you know, the the biggest provincial mental hospital. I think, and uh, I'm not exactly sure of the numbers, but I believe there were roughly 2,000 beds in the hospital and roughly 4,000 patients. So this is a massively overcrowded, desolate place in in need of reform on every level. And Osmond had already been working in the, in the UK for some time. He was a trained psychiatrist, and he was very interested in hallucinations. Um, but he felt that the the environment that he worked in 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 the UK was very much psychoanalytically dominated, and there wasn't much room for uh, these discussions and certainly his his research interest in hallucinations. And so he took he took this job out in the windswept prairies of Saskatchewan. Uh, I don't know that his wife ever fully forgave him. It was quite a move into a, quite a cold climate, 
And uh, but they moved there, and right away he set about identifying willing collaborators. Um, and he, not everybody appreciated this British guy showing up and telling them what to do, um, but a number of people did. And very quickly he assembled a, a dynamic research team made up of psychologists. Um, a few years later, an architect joined the team, bureaucrats, psychiatrists, a nutritionist, social workers, um, and he had the support of the government. And he began investing in masculine experiments and quickly thereafter LSD experiments. They published their first paper within a few months of him arriving in Saskatchewan, one that he'd been working on for some time with a fellow colleague, John Smithies, who came with him from the UK. And they called it a schizophrenia, a new approach. And already from that early paper, which was a bit controversial, you can see some of the seeds of, I think, where he saw or where he imagined uh, psychedelics going. And for him, he was very, very interested in what we might learn from patients who suffer from psychotic disorders. And regardless of how this was diagnosed at the time, some, some it was bipolar disorder, some schizophrenia. But importantly, people who suffered from delusions and hallucinations, he felt, did not deserve to be sort of discarded as sick or unwell, um, but we needed to listen to the content of those delusions or hallucinations. We needed to find a way of understanding that language or appreciate that they might be, you know, experiencing some other way of interacting with the world. We needed to try to pay, atten pay attention to that. And that simple idea led him on this voyage. Then once he started reading about masculine, and once he got supplies for himself, he took some himself and thought this might be a window for him to access this experience that his patients seemed to be living in. But he felt as a psychiatrist, he was really uh, alienated from that experience and he couldn't help them if he couldn't understand. And initially, some of those, uh, some of the masculine experiments that they did really involved staff himself, uh, as well as these other psychologists and staff members, not patients as they tried to compare those experiences with what he described as frank biographies of psychotic experiences. And that is not um, me writing about somebody else's, but somebody trying to write about it themselves. And then they, they worked with patient groups and had patients read different excerpts of either someone having a mescaline experience or someone describing psychosis to see how well these matched. This was something he was very proud of. And it carries through his work in interesting ways, I think, this attempt to just widen our sort of um, containers or widen the landscape of evidence that we might draw from as we imagine then how best to care for one another. And that language is threaded through a number of his studies throughout the 1950s and well into the 1970s. Hmm. Well, once again, a slight detour on etymology. Mm -hmm. So... First of all, I actually realized during your talk uh, the day before yesterday, you mentioned the etymology of the word hallucinate, mm -hmm. and I realized that I didn't know that before, so explain that. Hallucin we, I, I am learning this as I go as well. I, I too had sort of used it interchangeably, and I thought, oh, that, that's a word that's been around for a long time. I believe... Um, I know that this is described in Plants of the Gods, in Hoffman's Plants of the Gods, and I can't tell you right now off the top of my head where he cites that from. But the the word hallucinate has Latin origins that comes from the 16th century to mean wandering of the mind. Um, but the word hallucinogen, uh, I believe, and I started looking into this, and I so far can't find counter evidence, but again, perhaps the, you'll you'll get feedback on this and help us to understand this. I believe that Osmond also introduced the word hallucinogen, which he later shied away from. Um, he preferred psychedelic, and as we've discussed, psychedelic remains with us today. But hallucinogen, because it concentrated too much on hallucinations, which are different, uh, people with schizophrenia more often have auditory hallucinations. And this idea of the visual stimuli tilted too much to the psychopharmacological reaction and less to the organic expression of psychosis. And he moved away from hallucinogen as the word to describe this group of or family of substances. But he was playing with these other kinds of words and drawing from hallucinate, of course, um, being one of the core features that he was trying to investigate. It's interesting how the practical use of words often strays from the original meanings because 
Yeah, I wouldn't have guessed that hallucinate refers to mind wandering because the context is so often meant to be that you see things that are not there or if you hear things that are not there or you imagine things. And of course, wandering of the mind is also imagining things in a sense, but, but they do have a different kind of connotation. Yeah, I, I too was was struck by this. I thought that it would have a more of a visual cue. Um, and yeah, it's it's led me to want to learn more about this, but I, I don't I don't currently know more. What I I find curious is when we think about the history of madness, I think the wandering mind um, plays a really evocative, it has a really evocative place in the history of madness, especially if we sort of delve beyond a, a medical medicalized world of madness. If if madness can also be something that might be creative and even kind of like moving on the spectrum towards genius or innovation or being able to see things that aren't there in a more positive way, then I like that kind of wandering mind idea that one could see something different that might be a wandering mind. Um, but I don't know, that's just me sort of playing with with these ideas and trying to think about the different contexts in which that word may have emerged. Um, but I have more work to do there. Mm. Um, spontaneously, do you happen to know anything about the etymology of the word madness? No, uh, I do know that um, it, it has long roots, um, and and part of part of what my mind goes to is the way that the word madness has been sort of re um, re adopted, I suppose, by mad pride activists, activists in the community who, you know, we, we might see as a, a bit of an umbrella term for some some people who identify within neurodiversity movements, but this idea of sort of pushing back on that clinical application that contains uh, psychiatric disorders as something that needs to be fixed or something that is a deficit or something problematic, whereas madness has more capacious um, qualities that allows for an expression of madness to be even you know, quite exciting, even enjoyable. Um, but I don't know. I know that in the 1970s, mad pride activists re, re sort of took back that word. Um, but I don't know where it comes from <laughs> in, in the initial sense. I mean, Foucault, Michel Foucault had a lot to say about madness. And I think, again, sort of anchored it in a particular moment in, in a, you know, a postmodern context in the 1960s and 70s giving it a different kind of definition or a different kind of connotation. They're not so much a positive one. Mm. I also find myself wondering about the difference in connotation between mad and crazy. Mm -hmm. My initial hunch is that crazy has more negative connotations. I think so. I mean, that is also my initial hunch. And I'm thinking, as you say, that my sort of library Rolodex in my mind is going and I can think of many book titles with madness in the title that has that kind of evocative connotation and not so many with crazy. Mm. Um, and maybe that's just familiarity or something. But um, but yeah, I think I think you're right. That would be my impression that madness feels a little bit more grounded in, in, um, in literature. Mm. And then the one final etymology question that is not a spontaneous uh, detour, but what uh, we definitely want to talk a bit about here is because the theme of the conference we were in was what is a psychedelic mm -hmm. uh, the uh is in parentheses so what is psychedelic and what is a psychedelic but maybe i'll ask the latter one so what is a psychedelic yeah you know I, if it's okay for your listeners i I was reflecting on this as panelists were asked to comment on this, and my impression from listening to panelists give answers to this as they, you know, I think we're also, it, it seemed clear that nobody wanted to put a particular definition on it. You know, it's a very uh, difficult word to define right now as we seem to be in the midst of something that is still move, moving. There's still a, a flowingness to it, um, or a fluidness rather. Um, I guess I can't help but be a historian because I, I am a historian and I I think of the what is a psychedelic in in temporal terms. And I, I think about the way that that word emerged in the 1950s, um, not simply as a reaction to a searching quality within psychiatry, but I think 
sort of on a global scale, at an existential level, this need for something to help make sense of the world at a time when nuclear bombs were going off and this kind of awesome power of technology was really terrifying. It was both exciting and terrifying, and I think the clarity on that was was you know mixed um, when you know during the Cold War there were there were really deep existential problems on the horizon that were not solvable through you know a quick answer or you know what we need here is you know more fertilizer or you know there wasn't like an obvious solution and the word emerges in this moment and I thought I I, I believe that it it offered a kind of hope. And to me, psychedelics also, prov thinking about psychedelics, the concept of psychedelics provides an opportunity for putting different minds together, thinking outside the box sometimes, um, but also trying to be creative about things that, you know, push beyond orthodox solutions. I think that's what we're going through now. And, you know, perhaps some future historian will call me out and think that this is madness or crazy. Um, but... <laughs> I feel like psychedelics are re-emerging in this moment not only as a specific response to, you know, the the frustration with SSRI medication, for example, if we wanted to go there, but really as a kind of hopeful beacon of, you know, we need a variety of minds to come together to think about complex problems facing our planet. And we can think about the scale of, you know, climate change, massive pandemic. Uh, we can think about inequalities, all of these really, really big complex problems. And I feel, you know, sitting around at these conferences, there are people coming from a variety of different walks of life and sort of organized around this concept that I think breathes some optimism into the moment. And I know that's not a very succinct answer and it's not even hard, to, easy to contain. But I guess in a word, I, I see psychedelics representing hope. Hmm. And of course, the etymology of the word is combined from psyche and delos, which mm -hmm. is mind or soul of manifesting. And it was precisely Humphrey Osmond in his correspondence with Aldous Huxley who coined the word. Word, Maybe you can uh, share that story. Sure, yeah. Aldous Huxley and Humphrey Osmond became friends in 1953 when, um, when Humphrey Osmond first brought Aldous Huxley masculine. And within a month after their first meeting, Aldous Huxley wrote Doors of Perception, which became a book that was circulated amongst different clinical researchers to give people an understanding of what it might be like to take one of these substances, mescaline or LSD at this time. And these two men continued corresponding, and they said, we need a word that is unencumbered from other contexts. It can't just sort of feed into the emerging pharmaceutical, psychopharmaceutical model or machine. It can't be too psychoanalytic. Um, it can't be too philosophical. You know, it has, to, it has to sort of have its own space, its own uh, linguistic capaciousness. And they played around a little bit. H Aldous Huxley wrote to Humphrey Osmond in 1956. It was March 1956. And he said, to make this mundane world sublime, just half a gram of phenerothyme. And, uh, Humphrey Osmond responded right away saying, to fall in hell or soar angelic, you'll need a pinch of psychedelic. And they published, he published that in a New York Academy of Sciences journal in 1957, and this launched the word into the English lexicon. And before that, they, uh, of, of course, also occasionally seen as that, but especially before that, they were referred to by many names. Mm hmm they used different words. Psychomimetic was one of the words that Osmond quite liked in the, initially. Um, and this, again, comes back to his his interest in mimicking madness or so the mimetic aspect of, you Psychotomimetic, know, right. Psych yeah. Psychoto, yeah. Uh, Psychotomimetic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. A word that is a bit of a tongue twister yeah. and uh, thankfully is not used. Um, <laughs> but hallucinogen, hallucinogen rather, um, the word entheogen comes out in the 1970s. It's brought around by ethnobotanists. Um, but there are also, of course, other words that I think are late to enter into this conversation, and yet they predate the context of psychedelics. So words like sacred plants, um, uh, different kinds of words that also we now perhaps want to include within the landscape of psychedelics. Mm -hmm. 
one angle I've been thinking about the concept of a psychedelic is because when you think about, for example, like uh, I've been talking with my uh, moral psychology researcher friend Michael Lakaswa, who has been uh, one of his re research avenues is how people relate to moral questions re related to robots and uh, as robot technology advances and also our AI technology advances it becomes, becomes obvious that we are going to have robots that are more and more either human-like or just like entity-like and uh, even already now even the clumsiest of robots or, or for example like now in Finland during the last year there's been an increase in these uh, transport robots that bring food to people from the shop to the whatever the pick up places and uh, we find it hard not to uh, what's the word for not for anthropomorphizing but but like when you put just like more generally animal attributes on, I don't know if there's a word for that zoo it's something like zoo can zoo morphizing can or you something zoo like morphize? that sure. <laughs> uh, so it's really hard not to do that already so it's like a a new cognitive category emerges which is not an object and not maybe fully alive mm. and when we when we have a new kind of category we need to think about new kinds of moral questions and ethical questions and and just like how do we relate relate to this new emerging phenomena in the world and in the same way i feel that psychedelics are because of course you could say that uh, about many different uh, classes of drugs if you now want to use the category of drug to to refer to psychedelics but uh but maybe psychedel with psychedelics it's uh, especially warranted because they're so impactful in so many ways in ways that maybe like opiates or stimulants are not so uh, because of the scope of their effects it it requires us to uh start emerging new new kinds of categories and it's not like that they don't easily fit into any uh, previously known category that we have and and even though we have had the category of psychedelic now for what 70 years or or so but still uh, is also morphing as we look into it it's like changing uh, the possible contexts that psychedelics may be used in uh, keep like updating or or spreading so it's like a a category that seems to be very much alive and changing as we observe it like mm -hmm. a weird quantum phenomena even though i don't really like to use quantum uh, <laughs> metaphors because i don't know anything really about <laughs> quantum mechanics but still like I, I in this particular case yeah like i like the idea of it changing when you observe it and like it's it's a uh, difficult because i've been also thinking about from the viewpoint of our institutions how because mm -hmm. psychedelics seem to be arriving in the mainstream more and more and uh it's natural for us to try to handle them through the institutional structures that we already have and partly we possibly can do that but also they require of us to imagining and experimenting with new sorts of ways of of handling such a phenomena they're not just drugs they're not just techniques or just technologies they're not just molecules they are like a, in the sense that philosopher timothy morton uses the word hyper object do you know of that so so the concept of hyper object is like a phenomena that it is spread over in space and time to be big enough for you not for uh, like it's not possible for you to grasp the mm -hmm. fullness of it at once and maybe not even during your lifetime because it's sh it's just like so multi-dimensional and and for example you can imagine climate change as a hyper object mm -hmm. or artificial intelligence 
the term has been criticized about like for being too ambiguous that you can look at anything as a hyper object but but i think it's still like useful and and psychedelics yeah because because you can look at them from so many different and m mutually contradictory mm -hmm. angles so yeah yeah i think that's really interesting and and i you know i can't help but start by looking back before i think forward <laughs> it's a disciplinary hang up i suppose and as you're describing that i was thinking about the way that in some different contexts outside of the the medical framing of psychedelics if you will but thinking about sacred plants or plant teachers you know this concept that doesn't get coined until later as entheogen but the idea that plants can teach us things and that we have this relationship with nature you know stretches into a variety of different kinds of indigenous contexts but even sort of pre-modern contexts where we think about that relationship differently and i think you're right that in our 21st century moment um in terms of the kind of the western institutions of knowledge formation we we typically want to sort of like classify things in these rigid structures or, you know, figure out what kind of PhD do you need to study that? Um, you know, is this botany? Is this pharmacology? Is it religion? What, whatever. And I think, you know, over the last, well, I don't know, we could say since the Enlightenment, perhaps, you know, we've been working really hard on, on getting more and more granular in those disciplinary perspectives. And something that these hyper objects might cause us to do is to step back from that granularity and embrace that ambiguity as we try to imagine different ways of combining these different methodologies that at some points they're at cross purposes, they don't talk to each other. Um, one of the things I love about going to psychedelic conferences is uh, I learn so much because I know so little <laughs> about so many other disciplines. You know, there's a bit of philosophy, there's pharmacology, and it really does require a kind of fluency or open mindedness, at least, to appreciate how different methods and disciplines are used to, you know, reassemble evidence. Sometimes we're looking at the same evidence and it's assembled in a different way to make a different um, claim. And I, I find that kind of exciting. It's exciting as an intellectual project to like pull this apart and say, okay, well, we, we're not going to give the upper hand necessarily to, I don't know, the chemists, you know, <laughs> with all due respect to the chemists. But we really need to have different ways of understanding and interpreting evidence in order to appreciate what it is that psychedelics might be. One thing I also really appreciate about the field is that somehow I feel that it encourages constructive dissent mm -hmm. or, or like, uh, is dissent the, the correct word, like dis disagreement or Dissensus is probably the word that I'm looking for. So there doesn't need to be a consensus on what psychedelics are, but yeah. there, can, there can be dissensus which can be fruitful and just like being present and paying attention to that dissensus like mm -hmm. makes you learn new things about the thing you're researching. And also, of course, psychedelics do have implications for so many fields that are relevant, not just in the context of psychedelics. Like, for example, maybe we'll talk a bit later about the impact of the Saskatchewan uh, psychedelic research had on mental health work in general. But mm -hmm. yeah. Well, I was thinking as you're as you're saying. I mean, I, I think that there's a reason why. Well, there are many reasons why some of those earlier histories. I, I'm talking about histories that were done in the 19 late 1970s and 1980s that focused on these kind of conspiratory conspiratorial aspects, these questions about ethics, these questions about counterculture. And I, I think, you know, we can dismiss those and say, this time we're going to be ethical or this time we're sure. not going to be countercultural. But one of the things that I'm realizing as we sit in these kinds of meetings is that to study psychedelics requires us to rethink what ethics mean or what is sort of moral or ethical or appropriate in these contexts. And it's not to say that there wasn't unethical con uh, conduct in the past, um, but they invite questions about what it means to enter into these kinds of relationships and reevaluate the kind of power dynamic that's at play when we engage in psychedelic experimentation. There was some conversation earlier in the week about what is informed consent? How can you give information about something that many just say is indescribable? And that might transform you and even your values in ways that are impossible to predict. Yeah. And does that then 
uh, overly suggest something? Does that, you know, leave an impression on someone and they feel ripped off if they didn't change their views? You uh -huh. know, So it sets up all sorts of questions that I think, you know, we can't afford to leave those alone in these fields either and just say, well, we figured out informed consent, so now we can move on. It invites a rethinking of that. I think the same is true with counterculture. And I think it sometimes in, in some of these conversations is used almost as a bad word. Like we want to make sure psychedelics don't, we couldn't possibly let them get into a counterculture or create a counter. I mean, they already have, they already do. But yet there's also a kind of um, intrigue or curiosity that I think uh, uh, goes hand in hand with a counterculture that is against mainstream. I mean, that is, I think, what the word is <laughs> intended to mean. Um, and there's an element of that that is very closely aligned with psychedelics, whether it is within sort of Western Orthodox medical research, trying to push that research out into a different set of uh, questions and understandings. I think there is something fundamentally counter or radical or edgy or marginal. All of those things feed into that, what you describe as this sort of like lack of consensus. And I think that's really generative. It's really productive. And psychedelics have a, a history of doing that. And I think, I hope they have a future of doing that as well, because I think that's one of the real values in, in studying psychedelics is to sort of not be comfortable. As, as I wish I could remember exactly what Aldous Huxley said, but it was something along the lines of, you know, anyone who knows what's what should take psychedelics. <laughs> and psychedelics remind us that we don't know what's what. <laughs> hmm. I'm thinking of whether I want to uh, spend a bit time disagreeing with Aldous Huxley because I'm really dislike statements of <laughs> like anyone in category X should take psychedelics or <laughs> should do anything. I should. I will give you some context so you can decide whether you want to disagree with him. He was being interviewed. I think I can't remember now if it was a CBS or sort of a mainstream American television program where the interviewee said, "Well." who should take psychedelics, you know, and that was when he said it. So it was a bit provocative in the context in which he uttered that. <laughs> yeah. It wasn't in a group of other people who were curious about psychedelics. It was mm -hmm. more to a television audience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can appreciate the spirit of that statement because uh, even though I wouldn't say that psychedelics always do that, but I think one of the most valuable things they can do is support you in realizing the depth of your unknowing. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. There's an abiding curiosity, I think, that um, is part of what I see psychedelics to be, that there's this, this relationship between curiosity and psychedelics that is perpetually in motion. Hmm. Okay, so now we can go back from this detour to Humphrey Osmond, who um, I had listened to his interviews before and knew uh, knew a bit about him, but uh, reading your book, uh, what's the full title about LSD from clinic to campus? Mm -hmm. uh, is there still some subtitle? Or? Oh, Psychedelic Psychiatry, yeah. LSD from clinic to campus, yeah. yeah. So yeah, after reading that book, uh, I... I had a more complete vision of the or understanding of the relevance of Humphrey Osman to to the whole psychedelic research movement. Uh, before reading the book, uh, he was just in my mind more just one of those characters. Of course, maybe you could say this about each of them, but uh, but still, he was he was in many ways ways relevant. Some of which include the ways we speak about these things, but also like developing practices related to them. So maybe you can continue on the story from before. Yeah, so after they introduced the word psychedelic, um, Humphrey Osmond ultimately spent about a decade in Saskatchewan. So in in what he describes as a relatively well-supported research environment, uh, both in terms of finding collaborators, but also having some dedicated funding. Um, and And really a kind of dynamic space where when you know people came through this space you really don't 
find yourself coming through Weyburn, Saskatchewan by accident. You know, you have to be very intentional about going to this this place that's not even near, very close to uh, a major city in Saskatchewan, let alone, you know, Toronto or Vancouver. And Osmond sort of leaned into this as an opportunity to almost create this research incubator. So people would come, they'd have to stay for a little while. He had house guests, you know, Francis Huxley stayed with the family for a while, uh, as an example. And it created this kind of, you know, uh, secure environment in some respects for really kind of getting down into the research. And to that end, he worked with a, a fellow psychiatrist named Abram Hoffer. They, I think they wrote letters to each other every single day. This is um, a fun deviation, which maybe we'll get into. But, you know, the role of the internet, I think, has some part to play in the history of psychedelics. But I'll footnote that for later. So prior to the internet, thankfully for me as a historian, now we have these typed letters that we can still read instead of texts and emails to sort through. Um, but they wrote daily about all sorts of minutia when you think about, you know, setting up the spaces, you know, where should we put the couch, how close, you know, really thinking carefully about things that we later come to know as set and setting. Um, already in 1952, they have a, a manual that they've produced, which is, I can't remember the number, almost 200 pages. And in it are really specific recommendations for things that, again, we would later come to see as set and setting. But they're drawn from these large, really kind of, you know, undigested, unedited responses from people who have tried psychedelics in this environment. And it's something I think is really, really important and worth um, sort of dwelling on. They said initially, Osmond was one of the leaders in this, I, I'd say, saying, like, we don't know which parts to discard. We can't, this is, not, this is an experience that we can't sort of summarize or condense into a series of yes or no questions. You know, we really need to let people express themselves. And sometimes it's a piece of artwork that their patients would later give them, um, patients or subjects, I should say, because many subjects initially were students in the nursing program or students in psychology. They were interns. They were other staff members. And again, partly because initially they really wanted to impress upon people the importance of empathizing with patients who in many respects were considered untouchable. These were patients they thought, you know, uh, we're not going to get better with, at this time there wasn't even uh, SSRI medication, but they really weren't going to get better by conventional means available to psychiatry. So warehousing them, trying to give them clothing, trying to feed them was about the best they could do. And they said, let's do better. And by I, I interviewed I interviewed a man a few months ago who's in his 90s. He was a psychology intern in 1957 and he came to Weyburn. He'd never heard of LSD. And he said, I, I went for a walk with Dr. Osmond, who was his research um, supervisor, and he asked him if he wanted to try some LSD and he gave him some protocols and uh, encouraged him to read Doors of Perception. And this man said to me, you know, very matter-of-factly, he said, so I, I thought I'd better do this because it would be good for my training. He said, and, you know, it didn't really have any effects. We walked around, we were walking around by the lake, and uh, I looked down and phew, my arms had become serpents. And he said, and I thought, I can't tell the good doctor that my arms are serpents. How do I maintain my composure while I'm having this interesting talk with my supervisor? And he said, but I turned to him, and he must have seen something in my face, but he knew at once what I was going through, even if he couldn't understand that the color of the serpents, he said, they were extraordinarily colored. <laughs> uh, he said, but that feeling of not being judged, that feeling of understanding, even something so bizarre as this, he felt that this, he could see how this could be a, a fabulous way of introducing students or interns or whomever to the way that we need to approach people with humanity and, you know, get past the judgment of these feelings. So he said, even when my arms were serpents, I felt he made me feel whole. And I tell that anecdote because it really impressed upon me that, you know, how 
this guy sort of comes into this space where he's very deferential to his supervisor, as many of us might be in a similar circumstance, and yet he was confronted with this kind of jarring experience. And what he made sense of it was that this was a very humanizing experience, and I think that's something really valuable to take forward out of those early days of those experiments really were about trying to just like humanize an inhuman situation, mm. you know, the warehousing of people. <laughs> Nowadays, we pretty much take it for granted that context is very relevant when when playing with psychedelics and uh, at least like not widespreadly you would say that it was understood during that time, but from the way you've described Osmond and his colleague's work, it seems that from the beginning they already did have quite a bit of understanding of the relevance of context. Absolutely. It's it's always surprising to me sometimes, I think, you know, obviously we can't read everything and uh, there's lots, but history gets sort of shorthanded. We sort of, sometimes it gets clipped off. And this idea that set and setting emerged much later is, I'm just not convinced of it. <laughs> and as I mentioned, this 1952 document, which is, you know, quite long and cumbersome, and, you know, there's lots of detailed, I should say, words. It's not, I don't even know if you can call it information at some times, because it's people just sort of explaining what they experienced. And in an attempt to make sense of it later, they realize that, you know, it's really hard to make sense of a bunch of trip reports, essentially, and then draw some, you know, clear consensus kind of <laughs> conclusions. And um, instead, they're like, okay, what we do notice is we need to have bathrooms that are very close to the rooms that we're working in. We can't leave people wandering in the halls to go and find a bathroom. So there are very practical tips that they take from this or that, you know, we need to have wadi water and coffee. Um, there were just different elements that they started to play with, the lighting, the acoustic dynamics of the space. But, you know, in, in addition to their own direct observations, um, they were also, Osman in particular, really read quite deeply. Um, he's often referring, and you see this in his correspondence, you know, I read this book or I sent this article along to whether it's Aldous Huxley or Humphrey Osman, or sorry, Abram Hoffer or any other of these collaborators, he's reading anthropological literature, he's reading parapsychology literature, um, and he connects with a number of people who are work, working in those fields. He was invited to participate in a Native American church ceremony, um, and he did so in 1956, and he continued to follow up with that organization. Um, he testified to the federal government in Canada about the legitimacy of this organization, that it needed to have, be protected, that um, in particular he was asked, you know, are these people having orgies? That was one of the questions in, in the parliament. And he said, no, these are sacred ceremonies. Um, and though peyote does not grow as far north as Saskatchewan, um, they should have access, this organization should have access as a religious ritual. And he actually goes on at some length in the testimony um, saying, you know, this is a group of people who have been stripped of their land, who have been, you know, their their own customs and ways of, like, their resources for responding to cultural change have been taken away from them. You know, th this is unjust. Um, even reading it, from a 2023 perspective, you know, it's written in 1961, one of these pieces of testimony. And it sounds, there are some rough edges of it, um, but the core of it is very sympathetic to the plight of Indigenous people in Canada, um, which sort of puts him, you know, with his British accent, he sounds like a colonizer, and yet the, the sort of spirit of his language is much more empathetic and aligns much more with the kind of work that he's doing in this greater or grander attempt to humanize weirdness, if you will, humanize human diversity, humanize all of these kinds of things that he's observing in his practice that have often been sort of put outside of the main, main frame. Okay, slight detour once again. So let's put a mental note that we are talking about context and set and setting and come back to that. But uh, since you brought up the Native American church, maybe you can talk a bit about that because uh, I don't think all of the listeners know mm. about what that is and also uh, what you referred to when you talked about the legal process. 
Yeah, and apologies for meandering. Um. <laughs> it's, I think it's totally welcome in this podcast because <laughs> this is a podcast for slow thinking, which includes de- taking detours and meandering. I really, I love it so much when there's no hurry to get linearly to one point to another constantly. I, I know that it's like, or I appreciate it when there's occasional, uh, very tightly packaged bits of information but still uh, i feel it's it's valuable to to let the mind wander <laughs> yes indeed <laughs> hallucinate <laughs> i think um the concept of set and setting has been attributed to timothy leary um but certainly there are those words are used earlier than leary coining that leary's quite good at coming up with catchy slogans um but there, there are a number of guidebooks that are developed in the Saskatchewan context and then others that are shared more widely around, uh, certainly I know of the North American context and I have no doubt in other contexts as well. But this idea that we need to, I guess there's two things. One is through direct observation of psychedelic, I'll call them experiments, but I want to put that in quotation marks, you know, these, because some of them aren't funded or recognized by a scientific organization. Some are part of ceremonial contexts. So reading widely, experiencing directly, there's a very quick recognition that this is not um, an experience that is reducible to a pharmacological effect, that there's a relationship between something in the environment. And it may be relational environment. It may be the the individuals who are sitting with you that uh, are the most important part. Um, maybe the music, it may be the dripping of the water that, you know, you and I can't hear, but under the heightened senses of maybe a dose of LSD, all of those sorts of things become important. So you can't rule anything out. But in order to try to come up with some guidelines then for how do, how do you instrumentalize that? How do you take that knowledge and make it into something practical? Um, this is where I think people like Humphrey Osmond were really curious about reaching widely, seeking out, well, okay, how do psychics get the kind of um, energy and focus in order to, you know, get into that trance state? So he starts reading literature and connecting with people who engage in um, different trance states. He participates in these indigenous ceremonies, as I mentioned, as a way to try to understand different ways of organizing space and social relationships in that space to either maximize an experience or to minimize the risks or the, um, I I don't want to put words in his mouth here, but like, they don't talk about flashbacks until later. There's nothing like that. But, you know, there are frightening moments that come up and that emerge in some of these experiences. So how do you create, I'll borrow Tessin Norani's word here, but how do you create a safe container for providing the kind of support that is required and support may be, again, relational, or it may be, you know, having a cushion that one can, that, that feels nice. You know, that all of these little things that are um, really difficult to condense into a single document or a single set of protocols. But I want to step back for a moment and, and say that I think that really sort of curiosity about those, you know, the sort of how wide you can cast that net um, really worked at odds with contemporary pharmacological research that is taking place at the same time in much of Western psychiatry. The sort of focus on pharmaceutical development, the reduction of external stimuli, the, you know, down to really looking at molecular levels and and looking at the sort of transactions um, And it's getting a lot of attention. And those kinds of papers are getting published. And pharmaceutical industries, pharmaceutical companies are making a lot of money by being able to find solutions to, or what appear to be solutions to psychiatric problems that perform consistently, that can be scaled across a variety of contexts, across a variety of experiences, genders, ages, et cetera. That is not how psychedelics operate. You know, I think, and as they sort of go down this path of thinking, okay, we we understand that these particular substances cause some reactions. Now we have to like think about environment in the biggest, widest way. I don't think they could 
sustain that focus or that kind of um, approach with the sort of, I don't want to mix my metaphors here too much here, but there's a kind of drumbeat of the movement of psychiatry and psychopharmacology at this time that is very much marching against that idea of opening things up. It's really a much more reductionist model. And that reductionist model, of course, I think goes hand in hand with an economic model that is is much more graspable. And, and the competition between a psychopharmacological solution for schizophrenia, let's, let's say, if we want to focus there, um, it's really hard to compete with that and say, you know what we need? We need ambiguity. We need diversity. We need long conversations. It might take two days to sit with someone and go through this. That's really hard to convince um, budget makers to invest in something that may have a very ambiguous outcome by comparison with, we've got this drug chlorpromazine. If you take it every day, it's going to reduce your symptoms enough that you don't have to live in this hospital anymore. And even if there are side effects and even if there are problems, the trade-offs were so much more convincing, I think, at that time to both an economic model as well as a medical model. Um, the psychedelics were really sort of caught in, in a, again, this sort of, I think, um, methodological differences, but also even a vision for how we, what we think is acceptable human suffering. Mm. I think I derailed you now a bit because <laughs> uh, I also wanted to have the uh, detour going a bit deeper to the Native American church, but it was also like this was something that we were going to cover anyway, so it's good that we did that here, and maybe we can now trace back a bit sure. uh, to the yeah. Native American church. So what is the Native American church, and and uh, yeah, explain the relevance sure. of that, uh, so the, to this. Mike J has a great book out, uh, a recent book about this, which uh, I will I'll try to sort of <laughs> condense a little bit in the sort of textbook thing. Um, the Native American Church is formally recognized in Oklahoma in, I believe, 1912. Um, Mike J. will have the answer on that. Perhaps Wikipedia does. Um, but in essentially the early parts of the 19th century. And what we understand about the Native American Church is that it condenses and legalizes formalizes a set of practices um, that stretch back, of course, um, prior to the, the 19th century or the 20th century, rather. It's a syncretic religion that brings together Christian principles with indigenous practices. It centers around what is sometimes described in the legal language as the sacrament of peyote. And what People like Mike J and and to some extent myself have and and other scholars writing on peyote and its relationship to the Native American Church. What we've tried to argue is that some of the language describing the history and the origins of the Native American Church are are quite sort of diplomatic in some respects. This is it was easier to gain legal recognition for a church that had Christian elements in it, that had a blending of indigenous and non-indigenous practices. And so the history sort of follows along those lines and sees this as a syncretic trans or pan-indigenous organization that worships the sacrament of peyote, which grows around the Rio Grande, so sort of the border between Texas and Mexico. But peeling back those layers a little bit more, um, we recognize, too, that there are a number of practices surrounding the use of peyote that are used in ceremonial, in medicinal practices, and healing rituals amongst different indigenous groups on both sides of the Rio Grande, so on the American side and on the Mexican side. And they're more, they're more diverse. Uh, yes, the practice of peyoteism is common, but the rituals around it are different. What's legal um, travels, though, the sort of legal story travels up the coast and all the way into Canada. Now, peyote doesn't grow there, but they were permitted to take pilgrimages to Texas to the peyote gardens um, to retrieve sort of uh, naturally growing peyote cactus. Mescaline is contained in the peyote cactus, and this is where those kind of white scientists, as the newspapers describe them, become part of this story. Um, so, in the 1920s in Canada, 
there are a number of raids by the federal police, the RCMP or Royal Canadian Mount, Mounted Police. They raid a number of indigenous territories and find peyote use. And this shows up in the newspapers and men usually end up in jail for carrying peyote, which they describe as a narcotic. Um, this continues, but it's fairly episodic. It's not widespread. In the 1950s, the Native American church tries to legalize in Canada. And again, there's a little bit of a, of a challenge here because peyote does not grow in Canada. Um, so they can't really claim that this is an ancient tradition that has been carried on because it simply wasn't growing there. However, there are kinship ties that link people across these different territories. And they held a ceremony, which Humphrey Osmond, Abram Hoffer, and two others, Duncan Blewett and Teddy Wekowitz, attended these white scientists. And in that ceremony, um, Humphrey Osmond took four peyote buttons. He sat in sat in ceremony with um, with uh, members of the Cree First Nation, the Red Pheasant First Nation in, in Saskatchewan, and later testified to the federal government that this was a sacred ceremony that needed to be retained. Um, and moreover, in addition to what I said previously, moreover, some of the concerns about um, addiction on reserves, namely alcoholism, may even be mitigated by embracing this more wholesome, you know, uh, religious intervention. And he, he said this was, you know, something sacred that we needed to protect. And I'll pick up on that and we talk about alcoholism perhaps a bit later. But um, so the Native American church has these little registered bodies, one in, the only one in Canada continues to persist in Saskatchewan, you know, stemming from that 1956 ceremony, which was recognized in 1961. Um, but it has chapters throughout the United States and some in Mexico, and some of them continue to retain these certificates of authentication, which allow access to peyote, some of which is on ranchers' um, lands in Texas now, which creates other kinds of tensions. Um, but it continues to exist as this syncretic sort of Christian indigenous um, religion. I don't know if that explains enough of the history mm. of the Native American church. Yeah, like uh, I found myself intrigued and wanting to learn more more about them, but actually I didn't realize before I read your book that they have also the Christian element. Mm -hmm. And this is also interesting because the three most prominent psychedelic uh, churches that are uh, allowed to operate in uh, at least some states in North America. It's so that Canada doesn't have states, but provinces, provinces yeah. yeah. But but so yeah, uh, in neither of those, uh, not every pro province or state mm -hmm. uh, le has legalized. That's them, right. Yeah. Well, so as I understand it, um, it's not that it's legalized by province, but it is recognized by organization. So the Native American Church of Canada is legally permitted to bring peyote in for its ceremonies. Now, those ceremonies may take place in Ontario or they can take place in different parts of Canada, but it is authorized through the organization of the church itself. And as I understand it, though, I'm I'm not an expert on the, the current situation in the United States here, but as I understand it, that's similar to places in uh, New Mexico and Arizona and Texas, that it's not the state allowing for it. It's the organization that is allowed to maintain or um, go on pilgrimages, for example, to collect peyote. Mm -hmm. Permitted by? In our case, I think it's Health Canada. Uh -huh. um, and I, it may be a state-by-state -state regulation in the United States. But again, it's not that it's permitted across the state mm -hmm. by anyone, but it is for those particular groups. And I think it is perhaps telling that there's a Christian element because I do think that there's a a bit of strategy involved, um, that it may have been strategic at the time of setting up those recognitions that, the, you know, don't worry, it's like a little bit Christian. Um, and some of that comes through in the retelling and some of the stories that sort of travel through this history that there is an element, which is not to say that it's completely ignored either, but um, but I do think that it was uh, diplomatic. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting that, yeah, the tree, tree, was our the Native American Church and Santa Daime and mm -hmm. Unai de Vegetal, which are both ayahuasca churches. And uh, I'm not actually sure if there's other smaller uh, is de denomination the word we're yeah. looking for. Or? It, yeah, denomination. But I, I 
completely agree. Those are those are the ones that come to mind as mm -hmm. well. That you know there is that kind of fusion element mm -hmm. um, that perhaps you know served a particular purpose. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and and it's also integrated in that it's honestly a part of it, even though they're all also maybe like uh, strategic strategic reasons for emphasizing that this this exists. But of course, like. Uh, I don't know about Canada, but Canada, but at least in the U.S., of course, the religious freedom, uh, the value that is given to religious freedom is unique in a sense mm -hmm. that it it may override things that it wouldn't override, for example, in Finland. Yeah, I do think there's probably an element of that, and. Um I, I can't speak to the American context with any sophistication, but but in, um, in an impressionistic way, I, I think that that's probably true. And I think that it gets bedded into some of the the ways historians and scholars have written about um, the Native American Church as well. That this is a really difficult um, argument to for American authorities to argue against, you know, because it it does align with so many other of these principles of freedom to worship and freedom to worship in their own conscience. And having met members of the Native American Church and and speaking to them about some of these practices, uh, protocols, um, there are. I, I hesitate here because I'm like I'm not sure how to describe this, but. Um, one of the things that really strikes me in the the literature and in the conversations I've had is that there's no there's no priest figure, um, and that's one of the things that was really distinctive, I think, and certainly that was emphasized to me that everybody gets to pray in their own consciousness. You don't you don't necessarily go through a leader. There's someone who directs the ceremony to make sure that you know protocols are followed, but it's not like a sermon or not like a one person sort of guiding the entire directing the thoughts you know it's so very has like spiritual authority absolutely yeah and that that piece is emphasized in the literature over and over again that the peyote ceremonies allowed people to have direct communion with god if one will if you, if you want to put it that way or that was the language described you know that you know, if I were to eat peyote, I make direct prayer. I don't have to go through an interlocutor figure. And that element of um, equality or a kind of like flattening of hierarchy was really, really critical um, and difficult to translate into recognizable terms. Like this is not part of you know, typical Christian organizations. Um, but that was something that was very important and vital to the maintenance of the Native American church. Um, as I understand it. And I think that's a really interesting, you can see perhaps, or uh, maybe I want to interpret you know, elements of diplomacy there, like, yeah, yeah, it's kind of Christian, there's a sacrament thing, and I get, mm -hmm, now we can do what we want. <laughs> mm -hmm. you know? It sort of opened the door, so to speak, to be able to continue the practices uh, that don't look like going into a church. <laughs> mm -hmm. So then, as... Osman and his colleagues partook in the Native American Church ceremony. You, as you mentioned already, that had impacts on the legal process of the church, and uh, and also it impacted Osman and his colleagues. Yeah, there. After the, I mean, not only did they did they write about it um, in a this sort of sympathetic way, um, but sort of cutting through some of the media coverage at the time that claimed that, you know, these were um, these were sort of drunken sprees or people were engaging in violent behaviors. The same kind of almost like a, a precursor to what we can imagine happening in the 1960s at the end of the period where, you know, it's like, oh, people are taking LSD and trying to fly or jumping off of buildings. It's not quite that to that degree, but that same kind of concern that, you know, these indigenous people are taking drugs and they're doing bad things. And and Osmond sort of cuts through that in his writing about this and in two major newspapers saying, that's not what's happening. This is this is a, a religious ceremony. Um, this is something sacred. This is something, you know, that's very sacrosanct. It is, you know, honorable. Um, and and he takes that one step further, I think, by then bringing home some of those practices. And he said, you know, we sat in a circle and the drumming really grounded the experience. What if we think about the acoustic elements of the these clinical spaces, these 
experimental rooms and bring in drumming, drumming. Maybe we bring in chants, uh, Gregorian chants they brought in at some point. They didn't ever, in as far as I saw, they never moved to like Jimi Hendrix or, you know, Janis Joplin or any, anyone we might superficially grab for as a like psychedelic musician. No, that always, also came later in the 60s. <laughs> it's true, it's true. Yeah. Um, they, they were always really keen to include um, classical music, but they played around with the tempo of that music, with the sort of chord structure of it, and they they have long discussions, not not these folks independently, but they reach out to people who were involved with music therapy, people like um, Helen Bonney, at, uh, was, who was at Spring Grove Hospital, who's really thinking about how to create that kind of sonic structure, I suppose. And I'm saying this to a musician, so my vocabulary may be inappropriate here as I describe how sounds are. Um, but they recognize that this is something that they also appreciated from the singing and the drumming that really kind of grounded the experience. They also recognize that at the Native American church ceremony, there were group practices at play. So this, again, sort of opens up the environment from a typical therapeutic relationship where you have a therapist and a, and a therapy a patient, if you will. Um, and now we think about group dynamics and what can be accomplished in a group setting. And it was something that, in fact, they, they say, like, this is the first time we really thought about these group settings. And they began to incorporate different elements that would allow for group settings. So how do you create safe space for a group setting? What are the ethics of a group setting? And it changes all of those questions again, or it opens up new conversations about how to adjust for that kind of space. One of the pieces of the group setting, not just the you know, uh, dynamics of it, but I think it really helped to bed down this idea of integration as being something that you can't just sort of tackle on at the end. But, you know, the ceremony itself required an element of fasting, um, an all-night drumming ceremony accompanied with peyote, um, and integration the next day. Now, it wasn't called integration. It was waiting to eat. And <laughs> you'd sit around talking about um, the experiences or maybe just like breathing in the, the dawn air. And, and then everyone would eat together and continue to talk about this and sort of move through those experiences and part of that also was about reestablishing kinship. So even people who weren't blood related to one another would form kind of ceremonial kinship. And it sort of widens that support network in some respects as well. And I think those elements were something that sat really deeply with those participants who took them back into a clinical space and thought about, you know, we can't just, this, this relationship is not a transactional one. You know, and, and again, if we think about down the hall, if almost metaphorically, but really in literal time, if the sort of move of psychiatry and psychopharmacology is to get, you know, patients to take pills on their own, even perhaps, and maybe not even talk to a therapist until they need a refill on their prescription. It's a really different model from one that is this intense um, therapeutic relationship, if you will, or if you want to call it that, that also involves integration, that is also open to whatever might come up. Um, it's not something that's easily collapsible into that, you know, exchange of a pill. Um, and I know I'm being a bit superficial about that, but but I think those kinds of movements were very much at odds with one another. Mm. By the way, one, one thing that I found myself thinking about as you referred to Humphrey Osmond's comment on the Valid validity and respectfulness of the ceremonies. Um, yesterday we heard um, uh, Manvir Singh talk about mm -hmm. um, a certain myths regarding indigenous use of psychedelics. Uh, and w one particular thing he referred to was, for example, Dr. Charles Scrobe referring to uh, ayahuasca never being used recreationally and they're always being like really strict uh, regulation around it, and and uh, Manavir was really like shaking that up and cr mm -hmm. criticizing that idea that actually like it's much more diverse and there are different, even though there might be like a particular way of sacred use that people, indigenous people, do stray from those kind of pro protocols and uh, and also also occasionally even abuse uh, 
the plants that are held as sacred. And I, I, I did find myself thinking about like, can Humphrey of Osmond really make that kind of a statement based on, based on just like one or even if it would be a handful of ceremonies because mm. uh, he cannot at that point probably know about the whole variety of what's, happen what's happening. Is it impossible to conceive that there might occasionally be orgies that involve peyote or, or something like that? Yeah, and I I would say that in the, in the context in which he was making those statements, um, yeah, I think he was being a bit political, mm -hmm. um, and his perhaps his his point was not in that moment to have his hat on as a scientist and be comprehensive, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and this could never happen. Um, but I think he was also very much lending his authority mm -hmm. in a moment where he, whether he recognized it or not, it became clear very quickly afterwards that others recognized his authority mm -hmm. as even more so than the many Native American church members who had been worshiping in their in their own way for some time. They weren't being listened to. And so I think for him, if they want to use it recreationally, that was up to them. And that was not sort of what he was going to use his platform or his authority to to in that moment. Um and I I guess I respect that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um he didn't weigh into those questions that I that I have seen either in the the video content or in the in the written record that um he he didn't comment on you know they could use it recreationally and maybe he did think that um he certainly wasn't uh, although he's been accused of being elitist in his views i think you know the fact that this guy probably he's he took a lot of different psychedelics and tried them and wrote about them but i feel like um I imagine him always wearing his tweed jacket when he's, you know, he, he doesn't come across as the kind of psychonaut that we might idolize today or the what we re recognize as a, as a psychonaut. He's quite sort of scientific in his views often, but I think that it's a bit of a misread of, of some of the ways that he used his privilege and power to promote, um, again, sort of the humanizing of mm -hmm, experiences. Mm -hmm. I think despite coining the word psychedelic, I don't think he saw it as his his greatest contribution or the, that it was his legacy. It was much more like his friend Aldous Huxley. It was a door to perception. It was not the perception itself. But this was a tool for imagining a different way of relating to one another. And um, to me, that's consistent with you know, his statements about, you know, this is good, leave them alone, <laughs> is consistent with that attitude that he takes to a variety of others, you know, whether it was, you know, women who were engaged in parapsychology who were not getting credit either. And so he co-publishes with them and he works with them and they're, you know, he's he's keen to raise their profiles as well and not in a heavy-handed way, I don't think. Um, but these different these different moments in his career helped me to or give me the confidence in saying that I, I think he was genuine about trying to um, trying to promote a different a, a kind of diversity. Um, we may not be as diverse as we'd want from today's standards again, but I think with with the people in his community, I think he was genuine in that. Mm. Okay, then to to go back to the psychedelic research research projects in Saskatchewan. So initially the focus was quite a bit on on schizophrenic people and uh, and the professionals taking the psychedelics in order to understand them. Mm -hmm. Was there at this point al already like uh, treating trying to treat schizophrenics? Initially there's he's not he and his colleagues are not treating schizophrenia as much as understanding mm -hmm, schizophrenia. Yeah. Um, within a few years, he helps to establish uh, the Schizophrenics Anonymous, which is an organization that is modeled on Alcoholics Anonymous to create peer support. Um, and it, it's a smaller organization, but it's still still going. And uh, th this is something that he says he's quite proud of. You know, in his when he was in his late eighties, he said, you know, this was something that he that was really profound for him that Schizophrenics Anonymous was was still around and and doing okay you know <laughs> flourishing might be too strong a word but um but that it was still thriving um but they moved from sort of 
empathizing with psychosis as one way or using it as a psychotomimetic um, to thinking about the application of mostly LSD and to a slightly lesser extent mescaline and later psilocybin for the treatment of alcoholism. And that became a real focal point even within the first two years of arriving in Saskatchewan. So by 1953, they published, I think it's 53 or 54, they published their first paper looking at the potential application of psychedelics, or it's not, not coined yet, of LSD, let's say, to alcoholism. And even yesterday in the comments on the panel, there was some discussion about, you know, the early attempts to use LSD to shock patients into some kind of recognition of the need to change their lives. And while I think that that was part of the initial idea, it very quickly changed. Like they had two patients go through that model and they changed their mind. <laughs> so it, was, it didn't last very long that they thought this would function like the contemporary shock therapies that were also being used in uh, psychiatric hospitals at this time. They, they quickly recognized that patients who received this, even if initially LSD might give insight into something bad that could happen or they might have kind of a bad trip um, and that would shock them, that was the idea. But they found that the vast majority of patients who came through that uh, that experience did not have that kind of shocking or abrupt confrontation that they were trying to achieve. Um, like I said, they did it with two patients initially, with one man, one woman. Neither of them had a shocking experience, and they said, "Well, maybe, maybe that's the wrong model. Maybe we need to embrace a different model." Um, what they found was something that I think has has taken up a lot more today, uh, which they fumbled around the language here, but they found a lot of patients were finding God. And they didn't yet put a label on it and say, ah, it's the mystical experience that is helpful. They, they weren't quite ready with that, but, um, but they said, you know, patients seem to have some kind of insight that is spiritual, that is going beyond, um, you know, reconciling a past relationship or a relationship with a mother or a father, something like that, which they anticipated. Um, but there was something even more profound. Um, and here again, they start reaching out to others like, okay, we don't have the language for this. How do we start understanding this spiritual dimension? And it was by the late 1950s, um, Alcoholics Anonymous continued to be the main intervention for alcoholism, which was still being debated. Is alcoholism a spiritual disorder? Is it a medical disorder? Um, there wasn't consensus on that yet. And Bill Wilson reached out to Humphrey Osmond to have his own LSD experience. So the co-founder of AA. The co-founder of Alcoholics Anonymous. And he had to do so somewhat quietly because he didn't want to compromise his position as, you know, a sober member of Alcoholics Anonymous who pledged abstinence as one of the, um, one of the principles of Alcoholics Anonymous. But he thought Wilson and others discussed how difficult it was often for members to accomplish the steps, the 12 steps that were required. Step two, and forgive me as I can't quote it exactly, but it's you know essentially to recognize a power higher than oneself. Um, and so for some, there was, was interpreted as, you know, recognizing God or having faith in a God. Um, and Wilson thought that you know, that was a really difficult step. And sometimes, you know, that whether you call it ego dissolution or self-reflection moment just wasn't being achieved enough to move people through the next steps and they were losing members um, and, and members were falling back into, into their alcoholic ways. But LSD seemed to be one of the mechanisms that might help to overcome that step. And after Wilson had his own experience, he agreed that this was a an amazing technique that might help to accomplish this. And so sometimes I think, you know, there's a, a sense that there's a tension between a 12-step recovery model that it was decidedly non-clinical, non-medical, competing with other medical interventions that might otherwise interrupt an addiction pathology. But here you have sort of a blending. Um, some of the researchers and, and psychiatrists using LSD to treat alcoholism were actually most successful when they harmonized that with Alcoholics Anonymous. And officially, they were still separate bodies, but in some jurisdictions, the two organizations are working together. And I think it's quite fascinating to think about. Again, this is 
a different way of imagining that set and setting or imagining that kind of integrative context and the supportive context surrounding that pharmacological reaction. Um, but the best results often came out of group therapy sessions that were done in in um, conjunction with Alcoholics Anonymous. Mm. And then the sort of flowering period of the initial psychedelic research phase continued for some time. Mm. What were some other important developments in there? I think there's a, a book called The Hallucinogens that's um, edited by Humphrey Osmond, written largely by him as well. And he claims that by 1961, there were over a thousand published scientific papers on hallucinogens on and again we might say psychedelics but and he goes through a whole a whole range of them some of these are anthropological literature as well but this would suggest a kind of like high point in terms of the publications of uh you know relative to other other research that's taking place at the time and it doesn't entirely fall off at that moment but i think things begin to shift and i well i guess there's two things one thing, can I talk about architecture for a second? Mm -hmm. All right. So I mentioned at the beginning that, you know, Saskatchewan was involved in changing its um, public health infrastructure. And one of the things that came along with that was reforming hospitals. So the still the Tommy Douglas government hired an architect named Kiyoshi Izumi, a Japanese-Canadian, to make some reform suggestions for the architecture of these giant psychiatric hospitals. And he said, you know, you should, you should go and visit Osmond. I don't know if he actually said that, but that's the <laughs> implication in the, in the letters. And he did. And um, Osmond became friends that actually Jane and Humphrey Osmond became friends with Amy and Kiyoshi Izumi. And uh, in fact, the Osmonds were godparents to their children. So there's a real kind of kinship forming there. And of course, Osmond explained his theory that, you know, in order to understand, you know, the people who were living in these spaces, you know, it's best or it may be advantageous um, to take LSD. And so Kiyoshi does. Um, you know, he's, he described how, like, he had used glasses for a long time, but he could take his glasses off now and he could see space in a very different way. And as an architect and designer, he became very fascinated with the possibility of trying to design spaces for people who have a different perceptual relationship to the spaces that they're living in. And so he took LSD a number of times and he wandered through the halls of these of this gothic psychiatric facility, you know, and these are dotted around the Western world. These aren't very unique. And he noticed some really basic things, like long hallways were very disturbing if you were hallucinating, if you were having some kind of distortion in your perception. He said, these were spaces that you may not want to enter into. And now if you're, imagine that you are a patient and in one of these facilities and you're supposed to come and, you know, come to social time or come and participate in any kind of activity. And if you walk out of your room and the walls are moving, it may be an intimidating space to walk into. And he said, moreover, tiles on the floors, especially different colored ones, you know, black and white even, may appear to be holes in the floor. And so he said, maybe people aren't actually antisocial or unwilling to engage in these activities, but the environment itself has become menacing, or it appears menacing in under certain conditions. And so to that end, he he designed a different kind of hospital, one that avoided some of these features, uh, both in its architectural structure, but also in those design features. Now, there was a bit of a mixed blessing here, I, I think. Well, I'll say two things. One of the things was he designed it for patients, not for nurses, not for administrators, not for, you know, whoever has to come in and count people or whatever. So there were some grumbling from staff that he recommended, for example, that the beds be lowered so that if you're sitting on your bed, you can put your feet on the floor. You can feel, you can ground yourself. You don't have to wait for someone to come. But for nurses, bending over to get people out of their beds was hard on their back. So there's there's some practical tension points here that don't entirely play out or they don't entirely sort of meet consensus. But ironically, perhaps, um, 
I don't know, I guess it was maybe two months ago, I was at my friend's father's birthday, and unbeknownst to me, his sister was a nurse at this hospital that Azumi designed. And for years, I had been trying to get information on how did this place actually function? After he built this new place, it was meant to be round. They weren't allowed to build it round, so it's a bit more rectangular, but it avoids these hallways, has different kinds of design features. So, but how did it, how did it feel? Well, practically speaking, um, funding was cut. So the building didn't get designed the way he wanted. Um, practically speaking, a lot of SSRI medications came on the market. And so people who had been housed in long-stay custodial facilities were living in communities now to a greater extent, leaving a smaller population. So the place was functioning differently already. So it was really hard for me to assess, you know, did it work? <laughs> the World Health Organization and the American Psychiatric Association both sent representatives to investigate this place. Um, at one point, it got a a medal or some recognition for being an innovative psychiatric hospital. But again, it kind of is almost a remnant of a bygone era because the hospital itself was representing changes that then were overwhelmed by other budgetary, budgetary and psychopharmacological changes. So I'm sitting having dinner with this woman who turns out she was a nurse there. And um, as she retired, she stayed on to do tours of the hospital. And so she'd learned about Kiyoshi Izumi, and she learned about this innovative architect. And she said, we are just so happy as nurses to work there. Patients were happier. She said that she'd been at different facilities in her nursing career. And they used to host tours to show, like, we use plants. We have windows that um, you can look out, but they can't look in. So all these really sort of detailed features that... Um, she felt were designed to help patients feel more comfortable in their own environment. Places that didn't have reflections. Um, the windows, yeah, were non-reflective glass, so it didn't reflect your own face as you were looking out. You could enjoy out. Little things like that um, that I think are, again, there. there's like perhaps a subtle reminder of this, of his influence. Um, but again, kind of the widened frame of like, what were psychedelics doing in psychiatry? It wasn't just, you know, um, a reductionist model that they were using, but really thinking quite broadly about how people interact in their environments and how they relate to one another. A lot of that sounds like design decisions that are quite normal nowadays. Absolutely. And they were more expensive. Hmm. <laughs> that was not popular. <laughs> uh huh. Uh, is also an interesting contrast to like what you would imagine as a stereotypical acid-inspired architectural design. I'm thinking of Rick Doblin's house, which is depicted in the acid test book, <laughs> where he just takes a lot of acid and designs this psychedelic playhouse for himself uh, to trip in as his home. But uh, but yeah, that also like reminds how much what we take for granted as like what kind of First, for example, like aesthetic effects psychedelics have on on creative people is not at all as straightforward as one might think. That it's a lot, lot of it is just like cultural trends. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I think that's true, and I think you know also imagining the context in which these people are working. You know, the 1950s cultural context was different from the 1960s when whether we already touched upon, you know, the musical inspiration or what counts as like, you know, psychedelic music. Uh, this this was, uh, Kiyoshi Izumi had fled from a part of Canada that was interning Japanese Canadians after the bombings of Pearl Harbor. He'd, he'd lived in a, a different way than, you know, he, well, he was escaping the federal government in some respects um, and lived lived in a way that, it wasn't easy to embrace his Japanese identity as an architect, and yet he found different ways. And his, I interviewed his wife. He died before I started my research, but I interviewed his wife, and she talked about how he brought Japanese gardens in without calling them Japanese gardens. So there's still these elements of the political kind of context at the time shaping where he felt safe expressing as well. And I think, I don't know, it's worth remembering that context as well. Mm. 
you've ref referred to Aldous Huxley a bit. Uh, for example, that his book had quite a big impact on, on the practical work of doing a psychedelic experimentation. Uh, are there other aspects of the influence of Aldous Huxley that you would like to emphasize? Yeah, I, I know, if I may, I, I think Aldous Huxley is very interesting and people have written about him, but I might take this opportunity to say that I think Maria Huxley and later Laura Huxley, so his first and then second wife, um, don't get as much play in, in this uh, context. And yet I think these two women in very different ways often were really important also to not just shaping his ideas, but inter Maria, if I begin with her, Maria niece Huxley, she... I think she stretched his way of thinking in really innovative ways that don't quite get captured in the standard narrative on this topic. Um, she she had relationships with women. She had um, relationships with women who were engaged with different psychic activities. In fact, at one point, or in the in the correspondence between Aldous Huxley and Humphrey Osmond. They refer to Maria's friend, the witch, in quotation marks. And uh, I will just say, with I think reading in the context, I don't think that is meant as a pejorative term. I don't think it has negative connotations in the way they're using it. And I wish I could remember a quote, but I can't. Um, but there's an interesting way that they, you know, through Maria, they're also sort of grasping or reaching or incorporating um, other, again, if we kind of like think about humanizing the weird, I'll say. I don't know if that's a fair way to put it, but I'm inspired by one of the first presentations I heard. Herva, yeah. um, archaeology professor. Yeah. Yeah. Thinking about, you know, and and I again I don't mean that in any pejorative sense, but you know, thinking about things that wouldn't be considered part of the the framework for understanding like how are we going to fix psychiatry? What we really need is to like think about seances. And we need, you know, to go and play bridge with this woman and her friend the witch. Um and have tea with them. And, you know, like these are the kinds of things that they were doing. Or go to the Navajo reservation, which Maria and Aldous visited and develop friendships with some of these people. And again, these are some erudite British accented, you know, they seem pretty elitist in many respects. And when you kind of think about some of the people they had to their houses for dinner parties or, you know, went on family vacations with, it's very fascinating to me to think about the the sort of wide network of influences. And again, it may not be, you know, with the internet, we can even widen that more more easily perhaps. Um, but I'm I'm quite impressed, I think, with the degree to which they entertain different ideas and seem to really take them seriously. And I think Maria is really critical to bringing in some, of, especially some of these women into this context who furnished these conversations with uh, different terminology, different vocabulary, and different ways of thinking about consciousness um, by embracing that kind of otherworldly, psychic, um, I don't even know what words to put on it exactly, but pushing outside of the kind of you know, Western orthodoxy when we think about like the scientific frame or even Aldous Huxley's very elitist education. And, you know, his, his grandfather was apparently, you know, Charles Darwin's bulldog, one of his close friends, you know, this very sort of long list of celebrated biologists in his family, including his brother. Um, this deviates very far from studying biology in the very exact sense. This is like, all right, now what happens <laughs> if we turn the world upside down and imagine um, this other way of knowing plants or understanding spirits or thinking about consciousness? And I think those are, again, really delightful features of this history that um, sometimes get played down a little bit, I think, for good reason, and also because there wasn't a tremendous amount of that information captured in you know, it's embedded perhaps in his thinking, but it's not clear or implicit in in his notes or in his books. Hmm. It seems important to engage with modes of thinking or or areas of interest that are 
not in good standing in any times uh, mainstream culture not just like it, it doesn't always yield fruitful results perhaps but still like you never know beforehand uh, which engagement proves useful or or helps you think about the box or recognize the limitations of your thinking i don't know if like the field of parapsychology has yielded a lot of uh, uh, the kind of results that have uh, like resulted in some parts of parapsychology being accepted. I don't know, maybe something like out of body, body experiences might have been something that's like nowadays more uh, respected uh, focus of research because it's understood that it's uh, a real area of human experience. Mm. But still, like, yeah, even if it doesn't bring, fr like, the kinds of fruits that, like, our capitalist logic demands, it's, I, I think it's in, in a way similar to why it's necessary to do basic research. You mm. don't always find anything useful, but it, that doesn't make it, like, worthless. Yeah. And, uh, and of course, it's, like, also, I value that sort of stuff just for the weird vibe vibe they like bring like I, there's in finland there's this classic children's book called noidan kasikirja the handbook of the which i can't recall is probably actually not a finnish book originally so it might be like uh, popular out, outside of finland but i recall when i was a kid and, and a lot of finnish kids read that book i recall the weird feeling that probably prepared me to, to later enjoy like david lynch stuff and all sorts of all sorts of weirdness and i think it's yeah having having that sort of curiosity is just like valuable in itself and it's also very interesting when people who definitely have uh highly polished critical thinking abilities engage with uh, fringes with a uh, 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 spirit of curiosity. Yeah, I mean, to me that is, and perhaps because I've spent so much of my professional career mucking around in these sort of texts, that that is so much of, of to me what is at stake with psychedelics is that, you know, curiosity about the fringes, or if I'm uh, summarizing that correctly, it's it's so much alive in the work of these early investigators, um, and I I really love that spirit. I, I think that's such a an important an important sort of spirit of curiosity that is required, you know, always. Um, and sometimes it seems even more that we are in more desperate need of that as a sort of you know a moment in human history. Uh, and that's I guess that's why I. I associate the this psychedelic moment with hopefully a kind of, or sorry, that is why I see psychedelics today as representing hope. Mm. That, you know, rethinking what we think we know, exploring the fringes again, <laughs> perhaps, <laughs> or anew, uh, is really, I'm optimistic about that and what it, what it means. Mm. So you were talking about uh, the Huxleys and especially the women who are of, often neglected in these psychedelic histories and uh, and this is also a topic that we wanted to cover so you can uh, elaborate on that more generally or you can also talk a bit more about the Huxleys however you wish uh, to proceed. Yeah, it's it's through doing work on um, and when I when I first started doing this work in the, like I said, I think in the early 2000s, um, I was drawn to these men working in this field. Um, and, you know, in part, it's because their names are on the papers and their research or their records and correspondence are available. And you can begin to sort of build a build an understanding or help to gain some appreciation or an interpretation um, through their words. Um but I started doing some oral histories when I was when I was able to when I got the research ethics approval, and one of the things that I, I always re remember this I was interviewing a psychologist who had trained in Saskatchewan who took LSD as part of his training not required to but it was an optional thing. Um, anyway, he was he was 
he was a big fan and, and thought this was great. And Saskatchewan was like, you know, really needs to be put on the map for this. He was quite gung-ho about that. And we had... Uh, we were recording the, this, and I was with a film crew as they were preparing some of this material for a documentary, and I tagged along to, you know, ask my own questions. But what happened was as they were setting up the cameras, it was these guys talking over there, and I sat in the kitchen having tea with his wife, Mary. And Mary and I just started giggling as she was sort of annotating. She would hear her husband answering these questions and is, you know, the psychology department did this or I did that. And it was very official. And I think sometimes when the television cameras are in front of somebody too, there's like, oh, this is official. I, I must, you know, be official and not giggle. Um, but Mary and I were not in front of the cameras. And she was there the whole time. I mean, she said, well, I was his wife when he was a student. And what he's not saying is how much he freaked out that night or, you know, what he did this time or what happened the next time. Or she was like, oh, he's chosen to tell this version of the story. And so I was hearing this sort of echo effect, um, which was not critical of him, I should say. I don't want to leave that impression. Um, but it really left an impression on me. Not only do I need to listen and talk to these women who were often very present in some of these moments and yet not written in, they didn't write their own letters or publish their papers, but also there was a way that the memory of these moments was co-constructed or, you know, her sitting in the room afterwards as we all sat around drinking tea and talking about this, she was able to remind him, no, no, it's not how it was, you know, don't you remember this part? And that dynamic also really brought to life other elements of this history that, again, would be left unknown, I think, because they're really, they're in people's memories. They're not codified or written down somewhere. And so I thought, okay, I need to rethink how I do history. <laughs> I have to go back and do it all over again. Um, and instead of, you know, tearing up my book or burning it and starting over again, I thought, <laughs> I'll just, you know, keep going and try uh -huh. and do do more of this going in, going forward. And as a result, I've been trying now to not only appreciate, you know, wives and girlfriends and lovers and daughters and you know, women in general who have played supportive roles often, um, but who've also played roles that are they witness a lot sometimes or they're left out. And so I've been trying to pay a little bit more attention to that, that, that dynamic within the psychedelic space. And I don't have any sort of like big, bold conclusions yet other than that I think that paying attention to those perhaps fringes are also important for understanding um, not only the history, but then what's at stake going forward. So thinking about the caring roles we think about psychedelics and guides and set and setting and all of these things that there's kind of like a, you know, well, yes, we all know that that has to happen. But actually imagining how women were working in these spaces and often in a kind of classic 1950s sense, it was women who were bringing the coffee. This was not a gender neutral moment. You know, This was women who got married and no longer retained their jobs because they were in, expected to stay home. So not only do we lose their voices out of the historical record, but the roles that they were, the, the, the jobs that they were performing sometimes were voluntary. They were there because their husbands were in charge of a research project, and so they made coffee or, in several cases, brought music and played music and, in some cases, were the last people left in a room with a patient who felt um, uncomfortable with some of the presence of others. And maybe that was because they were doctors. You know, maybe they wielded some authority that way. Maybe it was for other reasons. We don't know. Um, but in a number of cases, the last person left in the room, based on the case notes, was the wife of the doctor who sat holding the hand sometimes of the patient. Or in one case, I recall, you know, helped him clean up his own vomit. And perhaps he was embarrassed. Um, and these are sort of tender and gentle moments, but I think remind us something about the the supportive environment that is required and the roles that have been played by some of those people. We talk about it now. We need to have those roles. But I think even those sort of minor roles sometimes that are taken for granted are something that become really profound and really important as we read back through those case files or we understand, you know, that this 
minor player in some respects was actually of major significance in someone's experience. You know, someone who continued to provide support even as they felt vulnerable or exposed in some ways, you know, feeling sick in front of someone. People talk about the embarrassment they felt. Um, some don't remember it at all, but <laughs> um, I don't know, it's left an impression on me about like thinking very widely about who's who's part of this history or which roles or, or um, um, activities are, are really important as we as we think about how psychedelics might fit into our our future. Hmm. One character that comes to mind, and this is quite telling, that I cannot remember her name, mm -hmm. but precisely you described her full name is not known, but you described her coming true uh, in the notes, like you said, 50 times or different, mm -hmm. uh, 50 different like patient notes. Rita Hubbard. Uh, no, 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 it wasn't her. Maybe, maybe I'm mixing. Mm. Uh, her, but there was this message, mm. someone, message, message, how do you pronounce that? Message, message, is it message? MRS? Yeah, Mrs. Yeah. Mrs. <laughs> yeah. yeah, Mrs. something with just the last name. Mrs. In the Hubbard? Book. No, 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 mm. it wasn't, because uh, cause I, I recall you referring to someone who appeared in many of those notes and it wasn't known who this person is. I, and occasionally, mm -hmm. I don't recall exactly uh, who the missus is, but I know I've done. We've been trying to pull together different case reports, and I've, I've done a bunch of different, you know, keyword searches mm -hmm. to find. And there are a number of times that you know, we don't even. I can't even con confidently say these are one missus. These are multiple missus. Mm -hmm. um, the missus change because. Um, Sometimes their first names are used, and so I can't even confidently put that into verifiable categories to say, you know, this woman was here 50 times, but sometimes just misses was used uh -huh. multiple times as well. Um, and, you know, are continuing to grow this database, so I hope those those numbers may even change further. Um, but it is true that there's a almost a process of making those contributions invisible. And I don't think it was necessarily done out of malice. You know, it wasn't, you know, because they didn't like these women or something. It just wasn't considered important. And and anyway, that that's the takeaway message that I'm trying to draw from this and 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 remind myself that, you know, I need to be inclusive in in who I want to include in the history, but also who I ask for their memories. And um that becomes more and more fragile as a historian. You know, you move further and further away from the subject, and um, those memories are quite precious. Mm. Well, now that you mention, mentioned Rita Hubbard, maybe we can bring in her and Hala Hubbard. Mm. Who were they, and what was their relevance to this story? Yeah, if, if any of your listeners have read Michael Pollan's um, How to Change Your Mind, Al Hubbard is a colorful character who appears in his book as the Johnny Appleseed of acid. And he is indeed, I think, an enigmatic figure. He's, he's, um, <laughs> let's say I've been trying to track him down in various ways over 20 years. And I have seen lots of documents and I am not sure how to interpret, um, his sort of, you know, what would be his authentic historical contribution. And I say that because this guy is a story, he's such a character. I mean, he was in the 1930s and 40s, or sorry, 40s, I believe. Um, he was a double agent in the United States. He was a rum runner. He was, you know, working for the government against prohibition while selling rum on the side. Then he flipped and he does this in court and he's, you know, had one wife and then maybe he had another one. It's like, the stories don't, all line up. You can't get a straight line. And I can't confidently say, ah, this is the evidence that I'm going to believe. Because just as you get a piece of evidence, they think, okay, this this triangulates. I can say this happened. Then something else happens. You're like, how could you have been in two places at once? <laughs> so the guy is a really sort of slippery historical figure. And yet there's something really exciting about that kind of character to, to track through history as well. Because he shows up in a variety of places. Now, we know that he had lots of connections. He also had a lot of enemies because um, he flipped on <laughs> the authorities a few times. Um, at one point, he claimed to be Canada's 
sole or largest importer exporter of Sandoz LSD. I, I can't say that that's true, but he claimed it. He also at one point earned a PhD by paying for it. And so for the first year or so, he would sign his name and put in quotation marks, PhD, or doctor in quotation marks. It clearly was a scam. It wasn't a real, or he didn't qualify with some kind of exam. He just paid a place to give him a certificate. So this is the kind of character you're dealing with. So with that huge caveat <laughs> as to, I don't know what's true, um, there is an interesting story, I think, about Al Hubbard not only being this very ambitious distributor of LSD, but he was also a purveyor of, of different kinds of ideas about what we should do with LSD. So he allegedly, he, you know, walked around with a handgun on his hip um, and had a carbogen tank. And he suggested that, you know, before anyone take LSD, they should have a huff of carbogen to see how they would do. And if they had a bad time, then they shouldn't take the LSD. Now, a lot of people said, stop doing this. <laughs> But he persisted. Um, he also did things like brought strobe lights into the um, testing facility where, for a time, he was working at a place called Hollywood Hospital, which is um, actually not in California. It's in Vancouver, British Columbia. And uh, many people said, get that thing out of here. And he kept saying, well, maybe this time they'll like the strobe light. And no, people did not like the strobe light. He's associated with changing the music in the setting and really sort of bringing different elements into the setting. And I, I think now after going through the archival records, I think his wife deserves more of that attribution than he does in some respects. But it is true. I mean, he he brought in the, the rose, which is still used. I know Johns Hopkins is still using the rose, and this allegedly is an Al Hubbard intervention. He was also deeply Catholic. And... I don't even entirely know what to make of that, other than that, like the strobe light, he kind of insisted on trying to bring not a mystical experience, but very, very much a sort of um, organized around Catholic principles experience. And this, again, was something that a lot of people resisted and rejected. And in fact, some patients really recoiled at that suggestion that you should have anything resembling, you know, a recognizable Catholic iconography in the room. And some talk about, you know, um, confrontations with the Catholic Church in their past that left them quite upset. Um, it reminded them of past trauma or their parents or different things that were unwanted memories that were sort of forced into that context. Um, so he's he's tricky. And one other thing I'll say on on Al Hubbard that I think people like Humphrey Osman and and um, Aldous Huxley, who I've mentioned, I, I think are like quite open minded about these things. At first, they were like, "This guy could be really great, or he could be a disaster." <laughs> and initially, they they defend him. They allow him to come into this context. They correspond with him. He's, of course, distributing supplies. He's in Peru at one point. He's in France. He's bringing people and substances from all different places. But then they discover that he has not only been faking his credentials, which they knew, of uh, uh, having a PhD, but he's also been working with some... I don't even think that these are underground distributors. These are companies that are selling products that they claim to be delysergic acid, and um, they're quite unstable, and they're causing some untoward results. And I don't know the extent of those kinds of results, other than to say, we've decided that we are going to break ties with this guy because he's distributing supplies that are not good. Um, Abram Hoffer at one point says, you know, he sent me some supplies as supplies were drying up. Uh, Sandoz pulled back on their supplies in 1962. And they turned green. I said, don't tell everybody not to take these. You know, we don't know what this green acid is. Uh, we don't even know if it's acid. And so there are these different things that made him actually quite difficult to get along with as well. And it caused some real tension in the relationships. So again, depending on which part of the history you capture him in, he is this sort of fascinating character, but he's also really problematic. And, you know, had he lived a little longer, had the television cameras caught up with him, he might have had more of a leery personality. Um, but I think partly the timing was such that um, he really, his stories remain within local newspapers more so than in the kind of national press. Um, but yeah, 
that's all Hubbard. And uh, as we we finished a book a couple of years ago about the the Hollywood Hospital, and as we were taking it to press, it was literally going to the printers. I think that week, I got a phone call from a friend who said uh, they found Al Hubbard's house on this island in um, British Columbia, and they're tearing it down. Okay, cool. They found records in the walls. <laughs> so we stopped the presses. We had to investigate these these records before we could send this book to the printers. And it was just sort of like, to me, it was just such a symbolic reminder of this really difficult to pin down guy who is probably really important in the history of psychedelics, um, but also is highly problematic in so many ways. And it's one of those cautionary tales. And I think this comes up a lot in conversations about psychedelics. You know, how do we make sure that we don't have any of those characters who might take things off the rails. And I don't know where the rails are pointed right now, but I think some of those kinds of characters are inevitable in life, and their intersection with psychedelics is, is perhaps problematic, but um, but the, this history is littered with those kinds of figures. Hmm. And did those papers yield interesting results up to now? A, a little bit. It was about supplies again. Um, they weren't, you know, it didn't fundamentally change the way mm -hmm. we we had to write the book or anything. But we did we did make a few uh, adjustments as it it led to different supplies. He'd been going around with a suitcase with crystal chalices in it, which he had put LSD into these crystal chalices to try to bring some additional pageantry to the to the context. Mm -hmm. And he was also the scientific director of psychedelic research in in where was that? At Hollywood Hospital. Um, Yes, I mean, he he created letterhead for a number of organizations that I think only existed on paper. Um, so you can find his name associated with a number of positions. I don't really know. He was scientific director for a short time. It, I don't think it amounted to too much. Um, and he left. Well, he was, he was kind of moving around all the time. He was a pilot as well. And uh, from what I can tell, there was a lot of ambivalence about how much... Um, autonomy to allow him to have within that environment. Uh, so he was never, as to what I can tell, he was never directing alone. <laughs> mm -hmm. But but like, at least for a short while, he did have a big impact on Osmond. And... They were very curious, though, and he certainly had access to supplies. Mm -hmm. He His network, sort of his Rolodex, if you will, his capacity to network with people um, and bring different people into that environment was legendary and I think really valuable um, but the same some of those same qualities were also perhaps what made them a little bit cautious about him even from the get-go they're like this guy could be really interesting he might be really dangerous mm -hmm. and um, it turned out that they they became less and less comfortable with letting him sort of you know with trusting him to to make good decisions I think was really what it boiled down to but didn't they at some point also direct their own patients to some of his sessions he didn't run his own sessions. So it, Hollywood Hospital was run and managed by J.R. McLean or John Ross McLean, who was a psychiatrist in Vancouver. Hubbard worked at that clinic, um, but he didn't have to, though he was the scientific director, there were there was a board of people overlooking this. Um, and Osmond definitely directed patients there. Um, but Hubbard didn't have his own private space to work in. Or, I mean, he may have had that in his home, but we don't have those records. Mm. <laughs> it's quite possible. <laughs> was he trip-sitting people in some sense? Yes. Yeah, he was, before they called it guides, He, you know, or trip-sitting, I mean, but he was yeah, sitting with patients at the time. Yeah, same idea. And so did his wife. Um, and there were a number of people who came through that clinic, which was a private clinic in British Columbia, so they paid for those sessions. Um, there were a number of people who sort of graduated from those sessions and stayed on either on a voluntary basis or in a nominally, nominally paid basis to sit with patients afterwards. Um, so Hubbard wasn't actually there for that long. And again, that that detail kind of gets lost because he keeps his name on the letterhead, but he's not physically present for a number of years, even though he's continues to be associated with it. Mm. When did he die? It's a good question that I should know off the top of my head, but I want to, uh, my guess is in the 1990s, and I'm just remembering that there's a, a newspaper article about him in the late 80s with a photograph of him. So I think it's the early 90s, but I'm, I'm not, at one point I knew, and now I don't. <laughs> mm. 
Do you know something about his endeavors after the fading down of the psychedelic mainstream in the 60s? I don't really. I mean, and this is one of the things, because he sort of fell out of contact or fell out of favor with um, people like Osmond, who I had been tracking quite closely, um, Hoffer tried to keep in touch with him for a while, but they were very concerned about dissociating themselves with, uh, Osmond had moved to Princeton in 1961. Uh, Hoffer remained in Saskatchewan, and their attempts to retain what they describe as, you know, to retain any kind of credibility in the psychedelic space or in the scientific space even more so um, was really challenging. They faced a lot of pressure from government and internal pressure from within the profession. And associating with Hubbard at that time was quite risky for them. And I think they they didn't uh, encourage that relationship any further. Um And I think they were fighting battles on a number of fronts at that time, and perhaps also just, you know, that letter just didn't get sent. Um, but but they weren't seeking out a continued relationship by the late 1960s, for sure. Mm. Well, we alluded to the fact that uh, as the 60s went on, the research eventually started winding down. And uh, one person who is interesting Uh, around this progression is Sidney Cohen. So maybe you could talk a bit about him, how he started got started with with psychedelic uh, therapy research and uh, where he ended up, or where where his thinking and, and attitude ended up. Yeah, I I don't know as much about him as I as I should. Um, but what I understand is, I mean, he's a really important figure in this space in part because he's a curious LSD research, psychedelic researcher, but again, mostly looking at LSD in the beginning. Um, and he publishes a paper in 1961, uh, well, it's two papers, in fact, which starts to introduce the idea of some negative side effects. Um, and it's taken very seriously. And this paper, I think, you know, some of the people who are sort of within the psychedelic research environment, um, they don't really quibble with the paper initially, the first the first issue. Um, yes, there, you know, sometimes there are lingering effects. Um, but later on, this paper gets kind of pulled out by a, a particularly uh, American authorities who recognize it as they knew that there were bad things happening. And Cohen, it seems himself, is somewhat troubled and a bit ambivalent about this, that, you know, he wasn't trying to blow the whistle on psychedelic research. He was doing good science, and good science often means, you know, you report what you see, you report the results. So he wasn't uh, dogmatic or ideological in what he was bringing forward. And a number of the psychedelic researchers took that paper quite seriously. As I understand, you know, the, the concerns about what later gets called flashbacks, but Um, he describes it as this sort of persistent and unwanted, even uh, untriggered revisiting of the ac acute phase of the substance. I'm trying to remember the, I don't remember the exact language, but it sounds quite clinical. Um, and also a kind of um, a malaise that can sometimes follow for, and persist for days following the, you know, sort of eight hour event. Um And there were a number of conferences held in the wake, not just of his paper, but at that time saying, you know, look, what are you else, what, what are others experiencing or what are you seeing in your clinics? And there was some growing concern that some of these symptoms or some of these side effects rather needed to be studied more carefully and taken more seriously. And I think, I think those are really, you know, in the, in the main kind of, if psychedelics didn't become what they were, um, it would be kind of a benign Um, intervention. You know, it's important and it may help to improve things. But I think the paper and its subsequent, uh, the next publication, which was a little bit more damning, it had more case reports. So there were specific examples of people who had had um, untoward effects. And that became a kind of rallying cry for the sort of growing momentum of anti-psychedelics. So both within the psychiatry profession itself and then ultimately from other more legal authorities who were looking for examples of research to say like these are bad and we know if we fast forward to say 1967 there were a number of reports that came out in 1967 through 69 claiming that lsd caused chromosomal defects so, you know these are birth defects that were going to be caused by taking lsd or that 
You know, later there's a report that MDMA would put holes in your brain. Now, these made tremendous news headlines. Um, and again, these are these kind of nails in the coffin of psychedelic research. And of course, researchers later rejected this and, and looked into it and said, like, these were fabricated stories. But Cohen's was not fabricated. Cohen's relied on empirical research and and I think continued to sort of feed that um feed the momentum of the anti-psychedelic folks. And and I I feel sort of bad for him. It seems that he was a bit ambivalent about it. I know there were a number of letters that he wrote to Humphrey Osmond sort of saying like I wasn't trying to stir the pot. I was, you know, trying to reliably report evidence. Um and yeah, I think it's been taken out of context a little bit. Mm. I got the impression that he was uh, even like before he started being cautious that he was more positive at first mm. uh, and also that after that uh, still positive but critical phase that he started turning against like the whole idea is my understanding correct i i i need to know more about him but that is that is my impression as well but relying on other other people's work i haven't read his papers or mm -hmm. or studied his archives so i'd yeah, I'll defer to. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, as the 60s proceeded, uh, uh, the media coverage started to, sh started to shift because there previously had been quite a bit of coverage on like optimistic, hopeful mm -hmm. research findings and the potential of using psychedelics for the treatment of, uh, of many uh, Many problems, but then, uh, especially as it started to be used among the youth cultures, and and of course, like the context of use diversified, and this also uh, was both like it, it both resulted in and also was like uh, probably spread by the way the media covered. Mm. Uh, what was happening and this changed the atmosphere surrounding psychedelics and it changed the atmosphere fears, uh, uh, surrounding the research and it made it more difficult to uh, get research subjects who would not have a, a very strong mm. uh, opinion beforehand in either direction mm -hmm. maybe you can talk a bit about that yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think, like, part of what's hovering in the background during this period, so moving into the sort of mid-1960s, is a growing frustration amongst colleagues about, you know, how psychedelics are performing by comparison with other with other pharmaceuticals. Um, and so that's kind of bubbling along, and uh, that may have played itself out in, in other ways. Um, but I think the concern about the recreational abuse, and I'll use those words specifically because that's how the media covers it, the sort of reckless abuse, the un unwitting use of psychedelics that are causing all sorts of, you know, not just people having uh, non-ordinary experiences, but having them without their knowledge, you know, drinks being spiked or, you know, parties you know there's some famous examples of this that show up in the media but that really sort of whips up this concern frenzy and what i try to claim is a moral panic which we we can talk about um but i think those the kind of movement of stories from science writers about you know the potential for psychedelics to change the way we think about schizophrenia or alcoholism or whatever other kind of pathological condition um to medical student goes blind taking LSD or, you know, hopeful, you know, honor roll student jumps off a bridge. And that kind of idea that, you know, otherwise well-intentioned people with a good future were not only, you know, dropping out, as Timothy Leary would suggest, you know, tuning in, turning on and dropping out. They were, you know, not getting jobs. They were dropping out of school. And some of them were even plummeting to death. Um, now, I know a number of historians have sort of peeled back on this as well and said, like, the media headlines were overblown. Um, you know, the death rates cannot be necessarily uh, aligned with psychedelic use. There's a lot of polydrug use going on at this time. So, oh, 
death rate's going to be aligned. Can you explain? I didn't understand what you meant that, that. Um, it, It's not as though people didn't commit suicide at this time, but blaming LSD for someone committing suicide couldn't really be verified. And some of the investigations were like, well, they might have been on. We don't, we don't know. Um, but that that association became really, there was a forged association between violence or suicides and homicides. You know, if you take LSD, you will have this kind of violent reaction. Um, even though some of those stories turned out not to be true or not to be uh, verified, um, nonetheless, I think the concern that LSD in particular, I think, or acid, you know, was capable of destroying brains, um, like ruining the future, essentially. Um, that becomes, well, what I did in in the book is I accounted um, articles that appeared in newspapers from, I think, 1961 to 1969 or something like that. Now, it, it's rough. Um, I wouldn't uh, take this to the bank, but there were like five or six articles a year up until 1965, 66. Um, and then there are hundreds, hundreds of articles a year. And uh, even if I don't have the exact numbers correct, because I was looking at a microfilm reader and I don't trust my, these were not indexed papers. Um, but the scale, uh, the magnitude was so profound um, that it really left an impression of, you know, the, the magnitude of difference was, was extraordinary. The tone of those articles also changes dramatically, and different kinds of journalists are covering the story. So science writers disappear. Um, front page headlines are now kind of covered with these very, not just sensational, but um, you know, they're the same newspapers. It's not like it went to a different press, um, but really dramatic headlines that may sell papers. Um, and maybe there was some truth to them. I don't want to discount it all, um, but it really changes the image or the reputation of of psychedelics such that there was one before that. I mean, I think they were relatively confined to some of these clinical spaces, um, but it explodes into the mainstream in a way that is quite detrimental both to the, the future um, reputation of psychedelics, but also to that research, which you've alluded to that um, I remember Abram Hoffer explaining to me that he said, you know, we had, we were, we were in a good place. They had set up their playlists, they figured out how to design these rooms to try to optimize results. And he said, yeah, you know, these guys are coming in with armloads of their own records. They brought in new music. And he's like, I think they were using us as a safe house. You know, so people were now coming in to get Sandoz LSD, which was only then permitted to these medical researchers. Um, and they brought in their own records. And he said, I don't think it was their first time. <laughs> you know, so... Mm -hmm. And that some of them would be frustrated if they didn't have what they describe as a full-blown psychedelic experience. Mm -hmm. And so what Hoffer said is, you know, that this is this really confounded their capacity mm -hmm. to measure kind of naive drug reactions or frank reactions. Mm -hmm. um, and and there was a lot of heat, he said, and others confirmed, uh, from colleagues mm -hmm. who thought that, you know, psychedelic researchers were part of, you know, they were kind of a joke. They were no longer treating something that was considered important, mm -hmm. um, but they were, you know, fueling the youth in their desire to party or be hedonistic about these kinds of things. Mm -hmm. And that cleavage, I think, is really, it's framed as a black and white cleavage in the media reporting, which, of course, I think is, is more complex. Um, but nonetheless, I think the relationship between the the growing hype about psychedelics causing a revolution or causing people to drop out of mainstream society was sufficient to undermine some of the scientific research that was taking place. Hmm. I find myself thinking about the terms um, that are used uh, to describe very often the, the kind of media coverage that psychedelics uh, were being described described with and uh, for example the term moral panic mm. uh, what is a moral panic how do you define that yeah it's a good question from a, a book that I wrote so many years ago uh -huh. <laughs> I remember searching for a concept to try to understand what was happening and whether that was an appropriate term to use and I went to um, I think the book is by Stuart Hall, who helps to define, is a sociologist who helps to define moral panic. 
And I wish that uh, I wish that I had a better memory and um, could remember precisely what he said. I remember being convinced by his argument. Um, but I think, you know, in this context, or at least the way that I was trying to understand it was um, the reaction sort of becomes untethered from empirical evidence. And it becomes part of the ether of the part of the sort of um, cultural response to this situation. I don't know. I mean, there are a couple of other um, scholars, mostly sociologists, who've written about moral panics and talk about it sometimes in the context of, you know, like terrorism, for example. Um, talk about it in in the context of um, sometimes kind of racial injustices as well, where there's like a a kind of um, cultural fear against someone else. And so I was trying to understand whether you could apply that same theory or that same concept to a fear about the capacity for these substances to change people's behavior such that they would either be not recognizable, not predictable, that, you know, that it would somehow um, induce that kind of fear at a cultural level. Um, so again, it kind of lifts away from the empirical evidence that might be provided to say, like, this person took this substance and produced this or had this reaction, um, but just the fear itself of, you know, um, acid becoming, and I'll use the word acid because that's the word that kind of gets catapulted into the media at this time, that it has the capacity to, um, it could get into our water supplies, it could get, you know, that that kind of um, out of proportion with reality, almost uh, fear that changes its reputation and produces a kind of moral stance against the drug itself. Um, and I don't know if that's a convincing mm -hmm. argument. And uh, yeah, had I known you were going to ask that question, I might have like reminded myself and read those sociological texts ahead of time. <laughs> <laughs> but I remember being convinced of them at the time, and um, and I'm not sure if it's I'm not sure if it's the right concept to use. Um, I, I couldn't. I was really sort of grasping for something that would help to make sense of, you know, how can how can this have galvanized a, a reaction to something? You know, how did it create a kind of cultural moment that it, like I said, sort of relied on stereotypes to cleave a nation into generations, which is not true. I mean, Timothy Leary was not that young when he was recommending people take um, psychedelics. It isn't as simple as creating these kinds of binary um, conditions that were used to amplify the tension, I think, between generations or, you know, those who take psychedelics and those who don't or just say no, or, you know, as these really black and white kind of definitions of good and bad behavior that I think kind of lend themselves to more moralizing. Um, but I think in terms of the media representations, it's t tended to fit. I don't know if that. Mm. I find myself thinking like the delineation between a moral panic and genuine moral concern. Mm -hmm. How do you distinguish between those? Yeah, I mean, I feel like for me, the the panic element um, distinguishes it from concern by sort of prompting people to act. So forming parents associations that say, we need to like, you know, change our school policies on, on things. So there were, there were a number of schools that started distributing um, literature about, you know, not taking drugs or not taking specific kinds of drugs. And there's some kind of like almost, I find sort of hilariously ironic uh, messaging that comes out particularly like even more so in the 1980s than in the 1970s but um you know these drugs are bad people who sell these drugs are bad and they're dressed in sinister cartoonish kind of clothing um and you know you need to be on the lookout for this bad stuff um meanwhile in the same sometimes these are in magazines and the same magazines are promoting smoking and drinking alcohol and so this kind of moral association with, you know, not just bad drugs, but bad people who take them and may suggest you use them too, um, does not apply evenly to these other kinds of psychoactive substances that are flowing even more freely, perhaps, than ever before. And I think that that hypocrisy also maybe kind of landed on me or it sort of stuck with me as I'm 
again, I was I started off looking at how does this fit into the history of psychiatry? And I'm like, okay, so pharmaceuticals are coming out with more regularity and making more money than ever before in human history. And these ones are bad. Alcohol is being sold. You know, tobacco is being promoted. And and I couldn't I couldn't get past the the contradictions that existed there. And perhaps that's me then being even heavy handed in my in my characterization of it. But I think the panic was, you know, partially born out of that hypocrisy. And like, we need to do something about this. We need to get films out. We need schools on board. We need, you know, government action. The UN had a con a convention to say, what are we going to do about this? And you create this scheduled list. I mean, I think that to me is is indicative of some kind of panic of some, you know, Concern might be more measured. It might be slow. This happened quite quickly and with bold strides, um, and some of which have not fundamentally been revisited until the last 10 years. Mm. I find myself thinking about the rate of transformation that psychedelics facilitate mm. and thinking about them in the context of the early 60s or, or or even late 60s there's been nothing in our culture that's even remotely similar to them to psychedelics and i'm trying to put my sh myself in the shoes of the people who are who have not taken them who don't don't know much about them and who see things starting to transform rapidly and uh and I can empathize with the the feeling that something needs to be done at, in that situation. And uh, when I'm thinking, because I expressed the term moral concern, I can understand also that uh, what like Timothy Leary crystallized in his slogan, mm. uh, suggested by Marshall McLuhan, I think, turn yeah. on, tune in, drop out. Um, I think it's hard to to draw the line between like when that is healthy and fruitful, like just like stepping out of the norms of society, uh, and when it's actually like either in some sense pathological or escapist. Well, of course, escapism is also like it's. Who am I to morally judge someone else's escapism? But 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 still, I feel that there's some area of concern where it's actually like uh, warranted uh, to 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 have like strong reactions to to quick quick transformations that. Uh, shake the foundations of whatever structures uh, like the normal life is built upon and even though i i do personally think that we've all been for uh, i don't know how long for the last century at least we've been in, in a situation where we do actually need uh, rapid transformations in order to make our lifestyle sustainable at all or survivable mm -hmm. at all it's still understandable that when there's that sort of upheaval that the psychedelics, uh, if not caused at least, like played a part in in the 60s. It's like very understandable that people in all times when, when things start sh sh shaking up, because there's no guarantee where the transformation or revolution or whatever it is uh, that's mm -hmm. happening will lead. So, yeah. I, I think it, you're absolutely right. And I, I think this question about the, you know, I was going to say, you know, the the context of these swift actions are also not, you know, a handful or even even hundreds or thousands of people at a Grateful Dead concert. And, you know, Richard Nixon is just like, that's enough. I can't take any more Jerry Garcia. I mean, it, it wasn't that. Um, I think that, you know, drugs in general um, – that fall onto the bad side of, you know, the black and white good and dr bad drugs. Um, drugs that are associated with, whether fairly or not, with protest marches, with, you know, there's a whole lot of social justice activism that was really exploding, and particularly in the, in the United States, and very much televised. Um, and 
it's not, you know, there were other uh, protest marches, I think, of, you know, 1968 being a pivotal year. You know, the Soviets were moving into Czechoslovakia. Um, France was riding with labor strikes. There were a lot of different kinds of expressions of civil unrest. And I think uh, it's really difficult to, I, I, you say, being in the shoes of someone who hasn't taken psychedelics, I was going to say, I can't imagine being in the shoes of Richard Nixon for like so many reasons. <laughs> but if you're if you're in in command so to speak and there are civil rights marches throughout your country, there are feminist marches, there's gay liberation movements, um and anti-Vietnam war which seems perhaps could be interpreted as like a direct a front to a state who is trying to express itself. You know, I, I'm trying to be sympathetic here, but I think that that kind of um, protest movement, and and you see it sort of ricocheting around the world. Brazil is in a dictatorship. They have people marching in the streets. You know, there are a number of different places that are really, um, there's a lot of civil unrest, but it's really difficult to, I think, find a neat way to quell that moment. Um, and I think isolating drugs like cannabis and heroin and LSD, like you guys are the problem. If people just don't have access to those, then not only will it perhaps quell the the civil unrest, which I don't even think that those leaders were so naive to think that, um, but it will mark up the the protests in different ways. It'll carve them out in different ways. It'll create splinters. It maybe, you know, it'll distract people from what's really uh at risk here. And I mean, you know, in some respects, I mean, to put my feet in somebody else's shoes, you know, capitalism was on trial in some respects as well. And I think um, isolating drugs, focusing on drugs, making this an issue that's about drugs instead of human rights or, you know, some other kind of social justice claim um, was a neat way to move things forward in that particular moment. And I, I don't say that to justify it. But I do think that it's not – I don't think LSD was really uh, – or psychedelics or cannabis. I don't think these were necessarily like going to save or ruin the planet as substances. But they were associated with a, a moment, a kind of pinnacle moment in in civil unrest that that coincided in that, in that moment and became, I don't know, it was easier to focus on the drugs than it was to focus on people – let alone solve the social justice issues that were um, plaguing society in, in a meaningful way. That stuff takes time, mm. right? That's maybe cynical of me, but um, mm. yeah. And I was just going to say that it's interesting to me, and I don't have a, any conclusion on this, but it is just interesting to witness the re-emergence, and I know that psychedelics didn't entirely disappear, but I mean, the kind of um, re-emergence of psychedelics within mainstream discourse. And again, it coincides with aspects of, I think, civil unrest that, you know, they're popping up in different ways, and we may say they're different groups. Um, but I think there's kind of a, um, I don't want to say peak, but like, there's a real bubbling up of deep seething unrest that we see expressed in different forms around the world right now. Um, and again, I don't think this is caused by psychedelics, but the relationship between these two things that may be emerging at the same time coincidentally makes me nervous mm -hmm. you know, that um, there may be a collision course here that is bigger than anything that we have, that any individual can have control over. Um, anyway. That's just mm. an unfinished thought. <laughs> mm. It does seem to me that uh, generally psychedelics tend to increase the amount of weirdness in, in people's behavior and uh, expression. Mm. And uh, weirdness here can just mean something that differs from the norms. And uh, it seems to increase the diversity of the ways in which people are in this world. Because the stereotypical image is that when people take psychedelics, then they grow dreadlocks and start wearing funny clothes, which is, which is a part 
of what happens, but that's also like, uh, as I think I referred to earlier, just also partly a cultural trend that is associated, associated with a particular uh, subculture or something. And, and in, re in reality, the the range of directions that psychedelics can, I don't know if push is the correct word, but but let me use that here, push people towards is, uh, uh, is wide and um, hard to predict. And it might be that occasionally, even though psychedelics might, might shake people's convictions up, they might also end up Mm, strengthening already existing convictions and it's it's mm. interesting to see that because they've been envisioned as uh, something that's very connected with left wing but as you know of course there's the articles by the Devonat and mm -hmm. Pace talking about like uh, for example right wing extremists uh, embracing psychedelics but there's also like uh, people like Jordan Peterson who's uh, I would say he's like core values, even though he occasionally seems quite extreme when he partakes in the culture culture war fights. Mm -hmm. But the things he talks about uh, regarding what's relevant to life, about like taking responsibility and and building uh, something that sustains, and thinking about not just your gazing at your own navel. Uh, a lot of that is just like uh, I would say non-extreme conservative thinking, but he's really into psychedelics, and he's been. It's obvious that he's been profoundly impacted by psychedelics. It's not just that he's talking about them theoretically. He's admitted to uh, mm -hmm. to psychedelics having a profound effect on him, and this also like diversifies uh, our understanding in like the cultural. Uh, Ecological, mikä uh, ekologinen lokero, what's the word that I'm looking for? Niche yeah. uh, of, of psychedelics. And uh, it makes it obvious that they are far more unpredictable than we've used to thinking. Yeah, you know, I think that's a fascinating point. And I'm struck by what the last 10 or 12, I'll say years, ish, because um, I, I don't see this tag to a particular paper or event, but the kind of thawing that has taken place about how much we can talk about psychedelics and who's allowed to talk about psychedelics. And it's very interesting to me to see major psychedelic conferences bringing out celebrities, you know, people who were not expected to think, I, I believe, you know, they they weren't wearing tie dye shirts or you know I haven't seen them pictured with, you know dreadlocks, um, you know athletes and singers and like Aaron Rodgers right in, exactly in the psychedelic um, science conference yeah and Mike Tyson on Joe you know but I think you know the I think the diversity of consumers of psychedelics if I can call it that or people who've taken them at least and maybe consume means more than once anyway. I think that there's probably much more diversity than we've been led to believe is, is one thing. Um, and I think as you were first talking there, I thought, well, but I mean, I believe Steve Jobs also admitted to taking LSD and he looks like a guy with a pretty corporate job. Um, and we know, you know, hockey players and I think Canadians and Finns are allowed to talk about hockey, right? Um, <laughs> We won't talk about American football, but hockey players have taken psychedelics and only much later in their lives, in some cases, admitted to having taken it and saying it was good. You know, not just it was fun, but like it helped me to be a better hockey player. Like who knew mushrooms help you play hockey? Um, so even though there are people who don't stereotypically look like hippies, um, Michel Foucault, I mean, the, all these books that are coming out now about Foucault and his his, uh, that guy definitely did not have dreadlocks. Um, now, we might want to associate him with the left, but his ways of thinking differently about the world, I think we would all argue um, or agree, didn't start with psychedelics. It may have continued to enhance, you know, more along the Pace and Devineau argument that it may, you know, reinforce certain convictions that one already has rather than um, fundamentally change from one recognized conviction to something completely opposite. And I think you're right. I think that who's, I guess, the way I think about it is 
whose stories get told or who gets to be the kind of ambassador or avatar for this psychedelic moment. And that will depend a lot on things that have very little to do with psychedelics, perhaps, or I will argue that it may have more to do with different kinds of really quite boring and traditional forms of privilege. <laughs> like, you know, it may be region and gender and, uh, you know, race and all of these other things that kind of boil down to like very basic forms of privilege that we can recognize throughout history as, you know, having some kind of currency. Um, but when certain people talk about openly talk about the value of psychedelics improving their lives or changing their perspective, um, it carries a lot more weight than, you know, a few people who go to a festival and might put feathers in their hair. You know, we don't listen to them as much, or I say sort of collectively, they don't have the same voices or the same microphones available to them. And um, I don't know what that means for the future, but I wanted to just make this one point is that one of the things that I think is really different about today's psychedelic movement as compared to the 1950s is the digital space that we all exist in. The, the access to digital technology and the capacity to amplify voices and to change the way we tell those kinds of stories. So privilege might change a little bit in that space, maybe, or maybe doesn't. Um, but the, you know, if... If I'm the only person in my community who's ever taken psychedelics, I might not talk about it. But if I can go online and find other like-minded, I can I can imagine a kind of consensus emerging or imagine a community uh, or even be part of a community that exists in a different way than one that was available when you had to write letters and wait for, you know, <laughs> wait for the slow communication. I think that has the potential to change the way that psychedelic momentum or psychedelic capital may move through this space and and also how we make sense of it, how we track it. Um, you know, it's fascinating to me that I'm I'm here in Finland talking to you. <laughs> and um, it's a pretty privileged opportunity to actually meet face to face to talk about these things. But, you know, for us, we we've already spoken about this online on whatever whatever digital platform it was. Um, and I think that is going to change the way that we can communicate with one another um, and build that kind of momentum as well. That I don't know if it's going to compete with traditional privilege. I don't know. Future historians have to figure that out. But um, but I think it's a dynamic that is, is, is something to be considered as we imagine how, how capital, I mean, social capital sort of accumulates in this space. Mm. I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah, and it's a uh, uh, it's like a skyscraper-sized topic <laughs> yeah. uh, that would take like three hours to dissect. <laughs> so I'm not sure like how deep because because uh, I'm already like thinking about larger societal and technological context in which this is embedded. Of course, which you alluded to too, but maybe we don't have time to go there. Um, but one thing related to this is that, uh, which is at least partly what you were already talking about here, is that um, when we talk about drug education, for example, that the state creates, that has lost its credibility, uh, uh, I don't know if there ever ever was very strong credibility, but at least like after the 60s, there was a time when the messaging that was put out was not easy to challenge publicly because we still lived in the time of broadcast media controlled by just a couple of big organizations. And uh, you've talked about how this might be changing due to the internet because mm, people don't need to go through a gatekeeper. I'm still interested in like uh, whether the current institutions that we do have um, are they thing what, what are the kinds of things they can do not to make people trust them because I don't think people should trust institutions. I think uh, institutions should aim to be trustworthy. 
And if that ends up people trusting them, then it's maybe deserved. But what do you think like uh, institutions should or might do in order to really be more trustworthy when it comes to talking about drugs or psychedelics in particular? I feel in some ways like that's another skyscraper sized question, Mm -hmm. or at least as I imagine it. I think it's, I think it's a really important question, though, in part because it's not just psychedelics that are on trial. And I think, you know, trust in science is in trial or trust in institutions or the trustworthiness of institutions. And I, I like your distinction. Um, and I, I think there are a few different examples that that are kind of readily available to us. So, you know, what do we do about global warming? Like, should we sign, should our government sign agreements? Do we not sign agreements? Who do we trust? What do we do as individuals? That that topic has given us ample um, examples of, you know, trying to figure out who we trust, you know, whether it's individuals or companies. Do we trust companies to lower their admissions? Like, it, it, it raises these questions of trust in really, um, really volatile ways that have, you know, turned people or even countries against one another, I think, in those conversations. And and perhaps something similar, I just want to give like a totally different example. Um, But, you know, the global pandemic has also really, I think, put trust on trial. You know, do you you trust the people that you get groceries with, that they are safe and taking precautions? Do I trust my kid to go to this school? Do I trust the vaccine makers? Um, It's really caused us to sort of I think, question which bodies or voices or authorities we go to to uh, to develop that trust. I mean, I would love to quickly learn vaccinology and make sure that I'm making the right decisions because I have my own, but we simply don't have enough time or energy or or capacity even. Um, I don't have enough capacity to learn all the things that I need to know to make those choices individually. And at some point, I need to take a kind of leap of faith. I need to trust something to get out the front door and live my life. But psychedelics are one of those pieces. And I think lots of other conversations are, or sort of lots of other big topics are also challenging us right now and figuring out how we trust, who we trust. When it comes to improving the trustworthiness of whatever authorities, I guess my mind initially goes to um, some of the universities, you know, universities as one of the institutions that's generating information, guidance sometimes, protocols about, now I'll, those other topics too, but now we'll talk specifically about psychedelics. You know, this is this is perhaps controversial what I'm about to say, but it's fascinating to me that there was a period of time when Psychedelic research came into play, and they, it played out in a variety of places around the world. I know there were Finnish investigators here in the 1950s. Um, there's evidence of, you know, LSD trials in in Buenos Aires and Sao Paulo, you know, in in Shanghai. I mean, there's all Bulgaria sorts of, was one that you mentioned also. Yeah, like yeah. all over the place. There are people invested in this, and some of it, you know, went places. Some of it didn't, um, in the sense that it, you know it really got a lot of traction in those communities. Um, But what I mean to say is that in some ways it was mundane. You know, it sort of fit within the kind of regular ebbs and flows of psychiatric research, and it wasn't that alarming. It it became that way for reasons we've discussed, but but it was sometimes rather benign. But I think the willingness of universities as institutions or research institutes, if you will, to sort of take that on made sense with the kind of scientific discourse of the day, right? This is worth trying. And the generation of people who were raised on the kind of propaganda about these drugs frying your brain or, you know, making you jump off of a building or go blind or what, those kinds of um, messages um, are sometimes now the people in charge of the research ethics boards. And they're sort of of an age where they're at the sort of top levels of administration in, in universities. And I say this I realize that might sound like a conspiracy theory, but it's been interesting sitting on different boards and commissions in North America and encountering that deeply held feeling in talking to otherwise what I would think are reasonable people. And I think 
it's very interesting to see how that attitude has become entrenched. And I think it has done a disservice to our capacity working in institutions to try to engender trustworthiness. Because the science and the ideology are still playing out in some of those spaces. Um, you know, getting funding for psychedelic research. I know, you know, Imperial College, for example, David Nutt has been quite vocal about some of the challenges in convincing regulating bodies or convincing funding bodies that this is worthy of reinvestigation. And so I think that the kind of um, rigidness of those institutions has made them not flexible enough to meet the kind of growing mainstream demand or curiosity. And what I see in the psychedelic landscape right now is philanthropy and philanthropists funding the so-called psychedelic revolution, which makes me makes me confused, I'll say. <laughs> um, because on the one hand, I think that gives tremendous power to individual wealthy benefactors who might then choose whatever they want, and by the same token, without them, then it seems that it would be even perhaps longer or more difficult to convince, you know, um, bodies that involve peer review and all of that with its problems, for sure. But those other mechanisms are kind of left in the dark. They're left behind. And so I think the, the, the philanthropy is perhaps putting pressure on the whatever, state-funded kinds of institutions or other kinds of institutions to to meet these challenges. And we're beginning to see that. We're beginning to see, um, again, I, I'm more familiar with the North American situation, but there are institutions now, Johns Hopkins was early on in the game, um, Berkeley, UC Davis, Stanford, Harvard, you know, they're announcing these psychedelic research institutes um, where they have these psychedelic research institutes, which seem to be a combination of private and public funding. Now, that may be what happens in the United States in general. Um, but it's interesting to see that it, it's taken a bit of time, and I don't know what that relationship, if it's going to balance out. I am slightly nervous about a philanthropic um, revolution because I guess to me, my my feeling is that um, it might condense down to those seeking a return on their investment. Uh, and the bas basic research is neglected and everything that doesn't bring fruits of power yeah. might get neglected. But of and course, at the same time, there's a, a very vibrant, passion-driven uh, research field that probably will keep doing what it's doing, even though it's difficult to find funding. Yeah. I, mm. I do think that it's a factor that, um, well, yeah, maybe uh, maybe this happens in other fields as well, but it, it seems it seems like a significant factor in, in this field right now. Um, and I just don't know enough about, I don't know, some other maybe form of technology that maybe functions under some similar kinds of principles, but... But I do see the, you know, the the use of testimonials of celebrity testimonials, for example, to push along this conversation is kind of remarkable. Um, you know that I don't know if that I don't know if it's a good thing. <laughs> mm. Maybe it is. <laughs> I want to sort of wait and watch this space a little bit more, mm. um, because on the one hand we have this sort of historical story of like, be careful, we don't want to have too many individuals with too much power in this space or too too much of a microphone because they might like, you know, tear the whole, the whole house will come falling down. Um, but on the other hand, we're sort of reliant now on these vocal champions in order to drum up support for what might be a more widespread revolution. And I guess that tension is a bit disconcerting to me. Mm. Yeah, I personally have quite a big distaste for, for the hype surrounding psychedelics and uh, the dishonesty in the parts of the psychedelic movement, which doesn't want to face the shadow side of psychedelics, which wants to push psychedelics as being much more safe than they actually are. I'm not saying that they are in any way totally unsafe, but I do think that they would need to be approached at least like a a bit more like 
sports in the sense that you know that sports is an activity that is not inherently safe. You can have safeguards, but you can also have freaky accidents, especially when it comes to extreme sports. Mm-hmm. And when, it's com- when it comes to psych, especially like, like the more powerful psychedelics like 5-MeO DMT, I've been thinking quite a bit about how carelessly people are touting it as a, a very, uh, mm-hmm. um, a very uh, time efficient psychedelic that you can just quickly use to treat your mental health which is like because i i think it's it is dangerous in in a sense that most psychedelics perhaps are not because of the intensity of the effects and uh, the uh, ease with which many people just like uh, trumpet the uh, awesome miracle uh, aspects that of course it, I cannot say that it doesn't have those aspects, but it's just not the whole picture. And of course, like a big part of this is just like an over, uh, what's the word, like com- over comp- compensation mm-hmm. uh, because the anti psychedelic propaganda was was so harsh that, and uh, yeah, I often find myself observing that people think that you cannot, you know, uh, flip out on acid and jump out of the window of, of a building that does, that's just drug pro- propaganda, which is, it's not. It's like something that happens. People have freaky accidents, like the musician Nick Caves, mm-hmm. uh, one of his twin sons died falling off a uh, like cliff on acid or something. And it's, it's just a reality that mm-hmm. things like that happen. And I think we need to grow a lot more maturity in talking about that stuff and putting it into proper context and not just like uh, uh, playing the victim card of we we are so oppressed as a, a subculture or, or people yeah. who are into these kinds of things. Um, and I actually want to, uh, in the little time that we have left, I want to circle back just a bit back to the 60s because, okay, we talked about how the situation started changing. Uh, the researchers had difficulty getting funding. They started having difficulty getting uh, subjects. Also, uh, hiring people started becoming difficult because the association with the dangerous countercultural uh, movement, uh, driven by people like Tim Leary or Ken Kesey, uh, was just so shocking to the the mainstream culture. And um, and you've also mentioned that Humphrey Osmond was like, uh, what was the w- word that you used? Like pushed out of the... Yeah, I think he was distanced a little bit. From yeah. the mainstream. Uh, maybe because we've been talking quite a bit about Humphrey Osmond, maybe we, you can somehow wrap up mm. his uh, story with the psychedelic research project. Yeah, I think... I think it was difficult to figure out, I mean, for him and, and his collaborators, you know, they they still fundamentally identified as psychiatrists or, you know, researchers and, and practitioners within that space. And while they were, I don't think they were, um, you know, deeply against, you know, the Grateful Dead. I'll pick on them because I know that Abram Hoffer went to a Grateful Dead concert, um, not, I don't think, to... Um, listen to the music necessarily, um, but he went with niacin. Um, and he went, it was in the mid-1960s, and he said he went there to distribute tablets of niacin and to sort of help, he describes it, and, and maybe others didn't feel that this was very helpful, but he certainly thought that he was going to help. He said, if you're going to take these drugs, just like don't let it get out of hand. And actually, niacin can help to reverse your reactions. And uh, and he was also a big proponent of niacin at this time for other reasons. But um, and he was like, you know, it's a vitamin. You know, he, I'm not patenting it. I'm, he wasn't making money off of it. So it kind of aligned with the principles as well. And I always find that kind of a sweet story in some respects. And having met him in his 90s, it, no one would have thought of this guy as a hippie. You know, this was not a hippie. <laughs> Again, he probably looked like a narc walking around in the crowd. Um, but it's interesting to see that his his attempt to forge that relationship was, again, I think quite genuine. Um, Humphrey Osmond met with, like, Owsley Stanley and talked to him about his 
his acid production and and agreed. Was Ashley Stanley the alchemist that's referred to? Yes. Because okay, I I know of course Ashley Stanley, but I wasn't sure like if that's the same person. I didn't know when I when I wrote the book, uh-huh, um, uh-huh, okay. but further research and with um, Ashley's daughter, um, I think I think we can confirm that now. Um, so yes, I, I think that's the case. When I mean Osmond, I think was quite sympathetic to some, you know, and I don't think he was one to say this needs to be kept within um, you know the the medical community. But I think as you're suggesting, I mean, proceed with caution, you know, and lots of things can be dangerous. Like Apoffer was famously on the news saying like. Aspirin can be dangerous. Anything can be dangerous. But, you know, you, we need to appreciate, you know, what are the effects so that people have, um, you know, can make good choices. And that might be a choice not to take it or it might be a choice to, like, do it in a safe environment or whatever it might be. We can't control how people are going to seek out these substances, but let's arm them with information about it so they can make good choices. Um, and I think that that attitude um, kind of gets swept away. And they really struggle. I think some of the psychedelic researchers, and they're not alone by any stretch. There are other psychedelic researchers at this time, including some of the ones at, at Spring Grove Hospital, who feel, you know, they're getting squeezed by their own colleagues in the profession, um, and they're getting squeezed by the media. They're considered kind of, you know, narkish types, I suppose, or, you know, they're part of the problem, the man, the authority, whatever, um, by their countercultural brethren, if you will. Um, and I and I think I think they get a bit frustrated, you know, because and again I say this in part because interviewing people in the 2000s looking back at this period that came out when I asked them, you know, what was it like and you know how were they you know, in their 80s and 90s, they're like, you know, those little jerks wouldn't listen to us, you know? <laughs> that was they didn't say those words, but that was sort of the the attitude. And And again, I've just sort of been reflecting on that even more so since. And I I think that proceed with caution. Um, The the mantra, just say no, which was flipped around to just say K-N-O-W, kind of loses its, you know, it it didn't maintain its uh, veracity in this space. It it loses its meaning. But but I think that was um, an interesting counter slogan. Like, know what you're taking. Let's talk about it. Let's, and it doesn't have to be elitist to talk about it or have information about it, but let's get some, you know, labels on <laughs> the products. And certainly there were no labels on the vats of Kool-Aid that were distributed in Dixie Cups at the Grateful Dead concerts. And that is not necessarily me trying to heap on people who did that either. But but I think some of those researchers felt very concerned, um, and that would be a moral concern more than a moral panic, um, that this this could go bad very quickly. And perhaps we need to sort of meet somewhere in the middle. And yeah. And, and despite that, I will also say that um, I've been spending some time in San Francisco and trying to learn a little bit more about the, the you know, the kind of epicenter of countercultural activity in the in the United States context, at least. And I think there were very um, genuine efforts to try to invest in what today we might call harm reduction or efforts to try to minimize bad experiences, have safe tents, have different kinds of first aid supplies. And and there, there were attempts to do that. It wasn't completely reckless. Um, of course, it's everything's more complicated. Um, but yeah. <laughs> mm. Do you know what uh, Osman did after his career in psychedelic research? He moved to um, Princeton, New Jersey for a while, and then ultimately he was in Tuscaloosa, Alabama, and where he carried out the rest of his career back at a major mental hospital, a big overcrowded mental hospital. Um, and although, well, interestingly, when uh, my colleagues and I put together this book of letters between Aldous Huxley and Humphrey Osmond, um, there were seven of us working on it, and most of us had never met before. And we had one meeting where we kind of came together as we worked on the project together. And there was a husband and wife team from Tuscaloosa, Alabama, from Bryce Hospital, where Osmond had worked. And Cindy Bisbee had been his direct colleague and was very fond of him and knew him very well. And she said, I didn't realize anything about his psychedelic past. So he clearly had carried on in a career where he didn't talk about it. And she's, 
they were very close friends. Um, she eventually, of course, learned about it. Um, but uh, but this wasn't something that became his kind of uh, identity moving forward. Maybe others uh, associated him with it. When I met with his children, um, they this wasn't something that was sacred to them either, this association with psychedelics. Um, what was present in, in both the interview I did with Humphrey Osmond and as well as in the meetings with these other folks was how much he cared about transforming those big hospitals mm -hmm. and finding space for for people in their communities or thinking about alternative communities. I mean, he started investing in some of the research that was also taking place in Manchester, looking at um, caring communities. And, and I think it's an interesting way of thinking about how he saw his own legacy or his own contributions. Mm. And maybe it's a lesson we should take for psychedelics as well. And um, I know this is perhaps a bit of a cliche, but I do think that the concept of doors of perception, even just the title itself, is instructive here that psychedelics offer a doorway into thinking differently. And that can be done at an individual level. It might be done on a collective level, but they're not the thing waiting for us on the other side of the door, but the door themselves. There's a lot of avenues that would have been intriguing to explore, but uh, due to our time strengths, I'll, I will now lead us to my short final questions that I present to all my guests, and you can answer with one sentence or more if you like. And the first one of those is an early memory that has affected the course of your life. Hmm. Gosh. That was a surprising question. I wasn't ready for that at all. Huh. I think an early memory that has affected the course of my life was well, partly because I'm here right now, but I'm going to go with this one. My grandmother emigrated from Estonia to Canada obviously long before I was born. And she was an incredibly proud woman and wouldn't ask for help. And uh, to that end, she laid on her floor for eight hours one time when she couldn't reach the phone when she'd fallen and broken her hip. And I remember, I was a, a kid at the time, and when this news reached my mother, and we immediately went to go and, and see and help my grandmother. And it just... The story, the life, and the dignity of somebody just sort of collapsed in one fall. This really incredibly strong woman and the helplessness all kind of, you know, like, her story just collapsed before me in my eyes. And I, I just, that just really left something with me about the power of, the power of stories and the, and the helplessness of people sometimes when we don't have each other to rely on. Hmm. What inspires you? Stories. Um, <laughs> um, I I'm really inspired by by meeting different people and uh, exploring different ideas and trying to stretch my mind. What are you afraid of? I'm afraid of oh, so many things. <laughs> um, environmental collapse. Um, capitalism, my children growing up too fast. Um, I don't know, I guess things that seem bigger than anything you can control or grasp even. It's also part of what inspires me though, I think. If things go well, describe your direction five years from now. These are really hard questions. <laughs> If things go well, direction from now. Um, in some ways, I hope that we're still having difficult conversations about psychedelics. Um, I hope we're not mourning this moment, and I hope we're not yet celebrating um, some kind of place that we've gotten with them. But I hope it it's a conversation that keeps going, and I hope to be part of it. Hmm. And finally... Your greetings or your suggestion or your wish or command or prayer or whatever to 
humans. Take care of each other. Listen to each other. And sometimes we have to listen even to things we don't want to hear. Thank you. Those are super hard. <laughs> <laughs> Serving the hard ones. Yeah, right. To the end. Thank you for listening to my conversation with historian of science, Erica Dick. If you enjoyed this conversation, uh, as always, your likes, comments, shares, and subscriptions are very welcome. And uh, if you want to support the podcast further, please check out the Patreon page at patreon.com slash curiousonearth. And I'll see you the next time.